Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Clodagh Doyle, and I'm the keeper of the Irish Folklife Collection and in the National Museum of Ireland. And this collection is based in County Mayo, and that's where I am today. But um, there's so many of our speakers are all over the country, in Ireland, but all in Scotland and all over the world. And so many people who are listening in um, to this symposium are in Ireland, but also all over the world. So it's amazing that we're all together and we're here for a short few hours um, to celebrate um, the good design. And this is a good design and it never grows old. Um, so this symposium is about, it comes about as a result of an exhibition we have in the National Museum of Ireland that was curated by Rosa Meehan. And um, it's a wonderful exhibition called our Irish chair tradition revisited. So it looks at the museum collection of traditional um, tuned Sligo chairs. And then it also looks at to the, how that tradition has been revisited with Sasha Sykes, her chair, um, Carlo chair on display, and also some students from the Letterfrack um, um, College, um, GMIT Letterfrack, and their, their ability to make wonderful chairs based and inspired by this design. So today is, um, we're looking at it's a symposium. Now, I had to look up what a symposium was. So seemingly it's a short conference with a particular subject, which is great um, because that's what we're here to discuss a particular subject, which is the chair. But there's a second meaning and it's a drinking party of con or convivial discussion, um, especially held in ancient Greece after a banquet and notable as the title of a work by Plato. So I think we won't do the drinking party, or the we'll, but we'll have the convivial discussion at the end on the drinking party any time after 4.45. Um, but yeah, so I work with the Irish Folklife Collection and it's it's a wonderful collection. And I always think that um, the objects that we have in our collection, they are very much, they're craft made objects a lot of the time. And yet they, they survive for generations because the craft is inherited. Um, but all the objects, be it the blacksmith or the carpenter's objects, they're always quite similar um, all over the country. And they're also similar. There's cross-cultural um, similarities in North America and in Europe, because whatever you need, the object is designed for a particular need. And if it's for food or shelter or sleeping, it's often pretty similar and good design doesn't really change and we find that a lot of our objects would have survived for many generations because they did exactly what you needed them to do and they were also very very much um associated with um um is sustainability they were made with locally made materials they're made with um objects that the objects that were made were what you used so whether you're using um whether you have a cradle made out of wicker or a cradle made out of wood or a cradle made out of straw, it's pretty much the same size. And, and it's just the, the objects, no matter what material, they're generally quite similar and they don't change because they function so well. Um, so that's certainly, and the other amazing thing I think is that there's no networking and nothing's done but from a drawing board. You know, nobody's sitting down and writing down and following patterns. It, the, the craft is inherent and it's in and, and it comes with the craftsperson. And, you know, there's no networking of blacksmiths kind of getting together every year and or craft people or carpenters. They just they just know they live in their community. They know what the community wants and they know their audience. They know their market and they know what's needed. And um, so I just thought that it is it's a wonderful collection of objects in the Irish Folklife Collection because it's the lives of the ordinary folk through the objects and ordinary people always needed a seat. And um, and now you know, I'm going to introduce you to our um, speakers today. I'm just going to bring it up. So for the, because um, sadly Rosa Meehan, our curator of the exhibition can't make it, we have a wonderful introductory video um, that Rosa had done as part of this exhibition. And, and then after that, um, we're going to look to another colleague of mine, Barbara Barclay, who had studied the works and um, the chairs in the museum as part of her um, 
her degree in college um, in GMIT. And so she had done some work on our museum collection of, of chairs. And then I'm going to, we're going to the Scots, who are Stephen Jackson and David Jones, and they're going to talk at 2.30. Um, they're both going to be part one and part two about um, the, the, their chair. They're going to talk about the, oh, Kakritor, the legacy, part one and part two. Um, Stephen and David can correct my pronunciation of that. And then after that, um, uh, Dr. Claudia Kinmoth is going to uh, talk about um, the the detective, the um, construction and variation and late evolution of Sligo chair. Um, and then we have a keynote speaker, Laura Mays, and that is at 335 Um we're all over the place and after that, um, you know, it's great because if you were all here, I'd probably have the role of... Um, doing housekeeping but thankfully we're all in our own homes and mine too I'm glad to be in my office because there's too much housekeeping in my own home but anyway um we'll have some session a kind of a question and answer session around 4 10 and we look forward and I hope you really enjoy this afternoon and um and it's lovely that it's just a short little bit of time um so Bolger of Andina, Agus Er Fudan Down, and um, Tommy Ray Kuntosnu, Agus Ta Buin Sulp Os on Tranona. Um, so have a lovely afternoon, and we're ready to start with Rose's introductory video. And, um, and then I'll introduce Barbara. But listen, thank you very much. Welcome to the National Museum of Ireland Country Life. My name is Rosa Meehan. I'm one of the curators here. In this video, we're going to look at the Irish Folklife Collection. We'll take a look at the furniture collection with a particular focus on chairs. We'll think about the craftsmanship, the styles, the design, the making. The chairs on display have been collected over the last hundred years by other previous curators. Let's step inside and have a look. The Irish Folklife Collection is home to thousands of objects that allow us to rediscover life in Ireland in the past. Throughout this gallery, you will find objects that tell us about traditional life in Ireland, with the focus on 1850 to 1950. The items of furniture like chairs, tables and settle beds were not found in every house. Some houses had very little furniture at all, while others had a large range of furniture including large pieces like presses or dressers. These functional domestic pieces are sometimes called vernacular furniture. Others may call them traditional furniture. But whatever the name, they were usually made in the local area where they were used. Some were made by a member of the household and others were made by specialist carpenters. They were all handmade often of local or imported pine, and sometimes reusing materials such as wooden boxes. But particularly from the 1960s, we saw a huge change in the furniture found in people's homes. Mass or factory produced furniture replaced the older style, handmade furniture. In many homes, furniture of formica or chipboard replaced solid wood pieces, and handcraft furniture became the reserve of the more well-to-do or wealthy. Chairs found in traditional Irish homes were not only made of wood, they were also made of materials such as sugon, which can be described as rope made from twisted or plaited straw. For example, the straw chair suits the shape of the sitter, giving ample support, but it is not very long-lasting as it can attract pests and is also more easily worn. It was also a fire hazard when you consider how important the hearth was in the traditional Irish home, where chairs would be drawn up beside the hearth. Here you will see two identical armchairs from the Toom area in County Galway. Made from ash, this chair features an attractive grain pattern that is mellowed to a warm, pale, golden colour. They have interesting designs where the front board of the seat joins the armrest supports. And this is a chair made by Thomas Durkin. Tom was a cooper, a carpenter and a shanky, or a storyteller. He was from near Turbacady in County Mayo. Tom worked at shipbuilding in Scotland in the second half of the 19th century. 
before he returned home to Mayo. His chair is heavier and larger than many others in the National Museum. It is made from ash and oak. T. Durkin is stamped on many places on the chair. It was made using a steel punch Tom had used in his shipbuilding days. Different classes of trees were identified in ancient Ireland. The oak tree was considered king of the forest. Durkin drew on this tradition when he described his chair as being made from the seven woods of the cross to Colm O'Loughlin, who published their conversation in a religious journal article in 1964. Let's take a closer look at the vernacular furniture and what it may tell us. So who would have typically constructed the chairs within these past communities? It would have been a skilled carpenter uh, that uh, made this chair and this chair came from uh, Roman County Monaghan. This chair would have dated to the 1900s, made from pine wood. The finish on it was um, maybe to make it look um, like a mahogany chair, a little bit more fancy maybe. But I quite like the design of the chair as well. Um, you know, the, the little bit of the board back on it and the little bit of detail there on, on, on it here. And as you can see as well, it, it looks like there was, you know, that there was inlay on it, like, but that was the finish that was put on it. This particular chair would be known as a hedge chair, made from wood sourced locally in the forest. There's a lot of skill in making a chair like that. The spindles there on the back of it, like, they're all hand uh, made and sometimes I'd say by hand, maybe chisels. You certainly would be talking probably maybe a day and a half to make a chair like that. Looking at it, I wouldn't imagine there would have been glue used because when the wedge went down into it, it, it spread out the leg to the joint, to the hole that was there, um, and the, the, there was no need for, for glue, and that's what held it together. There has been quite a lot of them low to the ground, but um, I'm not quite sure. It may be weir as well. That's what I would firmly believe, that it's more um, the age of the chair that has wore on the ground over the years. And you can see how they're spread out um, and that was to stop it maybe from falling over so that it would be fairly durable as well on the ground. There would have been craft people, carpenters, and then there would have been the handyman. The handyman mightn't have as much of experience of maybe the carpenter, and that's probably the difference in some of the quality of the chairs as well. The weight bearing of the chair would be very important, mainly because of the, of the, of the weight of it and the way it's sat on the ground but that would be, again, down to the design. You'll never go hungry, to say, when you make a chair. Um, but I suppose there's two ways of looking at that, like, is that, does that mean you sit on the chair to eat, or does it mean that for the making of the chair? Many people have their own preferred chairs or seats, but some may have pieces of furniture that were given to them by previous generations. Each piece of furniture at the Nash Museum tells a story. Who was its maker? Why were the materials chosen? Where did they come from? What is the particular design? Do visit the National Museum and explore our wonderful collections. We will be delighted to welcome you. Um, that was wonderful. We had Rosa virtually a video because sadly Rosa couldn't make it. She's on leave at the minute. Um, but certainly that was a great introduction and it was lovely to see um, our chairs um, and our museum here. So please do, as Rosa said, come and visit us and see our exhibition. Um, but yeah, so we had a virtual Rosa and now we're going to a real um, speaker. Um, and um, she is in County Mayo, a colleague of mine, and it's Barbara Barclay. And it, I'll let you take it away. You've studied our, looked at our collection of furniture, Barbara. So please, you t talk away now. Take care. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And I'm delighted to be speaking here today. Um, firstly, I just want to say I was looking, while I was waiting, looking at my opening slide, and it says Saturday, 19th of July, 2022. Uh, it, obviously, it's February. I don't know. My, that that date is my parent, my late parents' wedding anniversary. So I apologise for that. It should say February. I'm six months ahead of myself. So um, to start with, um, as I said, I'm delighted to speak today as curator Rosa Meehan is unavoidably absent. So to introduce myself, I wasn't involved with the Owl Irish Chair exhibition. It was curated by Rosa with partners Jan Froberg and the late David Lilburn. However, I've had a long-term interest in the Irish three-legged chair. I began working full-time with the National Museum of Ireland Country Life in 2018. Visitors to the museum since then may have met me in my position front of house. 
Uh, but my connection with the museum goes back 10 years to 2022. 2012, sorry, when I started volunteering uh, for Rosa, working on the National Museum of Ireland's wooden furniture collection. So I had returned to third level education at GMIT Mayo campus in 2011, doing a BA in heritage studies. I started volunteering with Rosa during the first year of my degree, and I went on to choose the Sligo tomb chair as the basis of one of my research modules. With the help of curator Noel Campbell, the then documentation manager, I searched the National Museum's database to see how many of these chairs were in the museum collection. This wasn't straightforward as many times they, in the, from the 30s, 40s and 50s, they were just listed as kitchen chairs. I then experienced what I call the nerdy behind the scenes thrill of searching the museum storage uh, for each of the chairs photographing them in situ and also finding out as much as I could about the history of each chair acquired by the museum. Some of the chairs have information such as this gorgeous index card on the uh, screen right now with detailed ske sketches of the chair and its joints. I submitted my research paper in 2013 but continued my interest and involvement with the tomb chair, including in 2016 giving talks on the chair and tours of the museum storage to school students from Presentation School uh, from Tum in County Galway. Um, I did think the exhibition, the talks, <laughs> the exhibition, the, the tours went well until I looked at the photograph and there's a girl yawning there in the background. Um, but anyway, my passion for the chair, some people would call it an obsession, continues till this day, but more about that later. So I've mapped the places where we have either documentary or physical evidence, the old Irish three-legged chair. The 19th century evidence is marked in the green dots and is all documentary evidence. The oldest documentary evidence is from 1832 in Drumcliff in County Sligo, uh, which is probably why the chair is also known as the Sligo chair as well as the tomb chair. The chairs in the museum collection date from the 20th century and the majority are from tomb in County Galway, so we can officially refer to them as tomb chairs. The, most, the re museum's most recent acquisition was, was two chairs from County Antrim. However, I'll explain later why I think these also originated from Tum. The National Museum of Ireland started collecting examples of the three chairs in 1931. Rosa Meehan discussed Tom Jerkin's chair in the introductory video. Uh, he was born about 1840 in Tom in County Mayo. And as Rosa mentioned, Tom Durkin owned a steel punch that he had used in the shipyards of Scotland to sign his work. And though he could not read or write, which was not uncommon in this era, he boasted that he could write his name with one blow of the hammer. The mark T. Durkin is still visible in five places on his chair today, and hopefully you can see that in my slide there. Tom Durkin died in 1920. His son, Patrick Durkin, followed in his father's footsteps and also became a carpenter in Tormakidi. Thomas Hughes uh, uh, was from Clonkeely in Tume in County Galway. So production of the old Irish chair continued in Tume in County Galway into the 20th century and chairs from this region are well represented in the museum's collections. So we have two examples uh, from the in the museum collection from Thomas Hughes. Uh, you can see here on the left, the one without arms and in the photograph behind it, these are obviously taken in the exhibition, you can see the armed version in the background and it also shown on the right hand side of the slide. Thomas chairs, Hughes chairs had originally been acquired by the local folk life collector in Tume, Dr. Thomas Costello. He donated them to the museum in 1931 and then in 1943. And as I mentioned, uh, these examples show the, uh, show the variations with and without armrests. Thomas Hughes was born in 1878 and was a third generation carpenter. His, great, his grandfather, Michael Hughes, was born in about 1800 and his father, John Hughes, was born in about 1840. Thomas's brother, Michael Hughes, was also a carpenter. In the 1911 census, shown here from the National Archives website, Thomas and his father, John Hughes, recorded their professions as master carpenters. In the 1950s, the museum acquired three tomb chairs through the Irish Folklore Commission. Two of the chairs were new when acquired in 1953. They have armrests and are identical. I know it's a very busy slide, but the, these two chairs are the ones on the left-hand side of the screen uh, with the arms uh, taken from all different angles. It's actually just do want to see it from all the different angles. Uh, 
it's re it's regrettable that the makers of these two chairs, ones with the arms, are not known as their structure reflects the three-legged armchairs being in made in tune from the 1960s till today. And this is particularly marked in the way that the um, arm of the chair goes down into the leg. So that's down, shown down on the, right, the far left-hand corner of the screen. The third acquisition um, from the Irish Folklore Commission uh, was acquired in 1956 and is in the top right of the screen and it doesn't have arms. This three-legged armchair in the NMI collection uh, doesn't have a provenance. However, in a 1989 article in the Regional Furniture Journal, Bernard D. Cotton, who was co-founder of the UK Regional Furniture Society and the author of the English Regional uh, Chair, dated it to about 1820. If this is correct, then it, would most, it is most definitely the oldest chair in the museum's collection. Uh, interest, interestingly, it has remnants of red lead paint, um, and I've tried to highlight that in the uh, middle picture, middle photograph. So <clears throat> Allo D uh, was a man who was the original owner of Corrib Crafts in Tume, County Galway, and he can be credited with indigence in making what he called the old Irish chair in the 1960s. The Our Irish Chair exhibition at the museum features a 1979 documentary from the RTE archives of an interview with LOD. LOD's philosophy of furniture is that it is a form of art, which in turn is a reflection of the character of people and their environment. He gave the example of, of Scandinavian furniture, it's attractive, utilitarian, but be, could, could be considered austere and cold. When considering the Irish qualities that he wanted to reflect in his furniture, he talked of the simple dignity of the Irish people and their warmth of character. He said that an Irishman, and I quote, would go to the ends of the earth to do something for you. So he wanted to convey that warmth of character, simple dignity and solidity in his furniture. In addition, his prime objective was function. He saw the beauty in function when an article perfectly suits its purpose. He remembered sitting on a three-legged chair in his childhood, which he found remarkably comfortable. But the later examples he found made by craftsmen over the years had, as he described it, described it lost the back. They had made the chairs with straight backs, which made them darn uncomfortable, he said. Finally, he found this old chair that had what he called the rake of the back. And this newspaper article from 1961 shows him uh, showing this the, the back of the chair with that bend you can see in the in the back. The chair was in pieces, having been thrown out because it was riddled with woodworm. But he gathered the pieces together, and with the skills of his carpenter and later foreman of his um, company, Tom Dowd, who I will mention later, they were able to make a template to serve as the basis for their success in making the chair that became known from the 1970s as the tomb chair. So the National Museum has one of LOD's chairs in the collection donated by Paul Hogan in 2005. Paul Hogan was a Dublin-born designer and in the 1960s he was a trade advisor at the state export development agency Chorus Tractala Cho, or known as CTT. CTT was concerned with promoting modern design in the Irish furniture industry. In 1962, Paul Hogan worked with Scandinavian designers to produce the publication Design in Ireland Report of the Stand Scandinavian Design Group. This pivotal report led to the foundation of the Kilkenny Design Workshops in 1963. In 1967, the first range of Irish goods commercially produced from Kilkenny Design Workshops launched simultaneously in Ireland and the USA at Brown Thomas in Dublin and at Altman's Fifth Avenue store in New York. In conjunction with this, a two-week exhibition of Irish textiles, pottery, silverware, wood, iron and art objects was held at the Little Theatre of, of Brown Thomas. M the museum's acquis acquisition notes indicate that this chair from LOD's Corrib Crafts formed part of this exhibition. In the Our Irish Chair exhibition, LOD's chair is located next to one of the armchairs acquired in the 1950s from the Irish Folklore Commission. This is uh, and they're shown in the top, uh, the slide at the top right of the screen. The similarity in the design between these two chairs is unmistakable. 
These two identical chairs were acquired by the museum from in 2018 from County Antrim. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see one chair in the back and one in the front. The donor of these chairs remembered them being in her grandparents' house from when she was a small child in the late 1950s. Her grandparents owned a pub and these two chairs painted, painted black to match a table were in the living quarters. The middle uh, photograph shows uh, the original wood underneath where it wasn't painted. The donor reported that they were rarely sat upon during the week, but often on a Saturday night, there would be a sing song in the living room and all chairs were suitably occupied with people singing and generally enjoying themselves. So they have seen a great deal of happiness in their time. Sadness too, of course. While these chairs were acquired from County Antrim, I believe that their design and make reflects what was being made in Tume, particularly the style made by Thomas Hughes, discussed earlier. Tom Dowd worked as a carpenter and then as a foreman in LOD's Cor Corp Crafts. Uh, there's a photo, the black and white photo in the 1960s there, uh, shows Tom Dowd in the middle with L LOD sitting uh, below. Tom Dowd later went on to open his own business, Dowd Furniture, at his home in Kilconley, Tume, where he was joined by his son, Francis. And the 2013 photograph is uh, when I went to visit them in their workshop in Tume. Uh, one of Tom uh, Dowd's three on the left-hand side of the National Museum in 1995. Before forming part of the Our Irish Chair Ex Tom Dowd's chair has been a, a popular feature at the National Museum Decorative Arts and History at Collins Barretts in Dublin as part of the handling collection where people can try out the chair for themselves. Uh, and there's a photograph of my son from many years ago um, trying out the chair. And Tom Durkin's chair is actually in the background at the top, second in from the right. Uh, twin brothers, John and Gabriel Blake, were apprentices in LOD's Corrib Crafts under foreman Tom Dowd and also appeared in the, in the 1979 RTE documentary. In 1986, they re-established the Corrib Crafts company in Shume, producing high-quality traditional Irish de design craft furniture uh, in, and incorporating what they call the LOD range of furniture. Last year, the museum acquired one of their chairs for the Irish, uh, Our Irish Chair exhibition, which you can also try for yourself. My range of slides so far has shown the three-legged chairs in the museum environment, but of course, these were originally everyday kitchen chairs. This gorgeous photo of Mrs. Costello and Child in 1930s Carrow Road, County Galway, was originally tweeted by Dukas.ie, the project to digitise the natural, National Folklore Collection at UCD in Dublin. Of course, my attention was drawn to the lovely chair she's sitting in. The style of chair appears identical to Thomas Hughes's chair acquired by the National Museum in 1931. After today's symposium, I wonder if, like me, you will start seeing the old Irish chair everywhere. This first photograph shows the on-site sculpture in Park. Artist Neve McCann incorporated the, the tomb chair in her sculpture for on-site 2019. On-site is an annual art installation on the grounds of the National Museum of Ireland in Turlock Park. The purpose of the art project is to encourage visitors to explore the themes of the museum through artworks. It is also to encourage artists to create works in a site-specific location. Titled Imram Pavilion, Mother's Lament, Neve McCann's sculpture incorporates the tomb chair. At the launch of the sculpture, Neve McCann referred to the past and how Knowledge contained within all were passed on from mother and father to son and daughter, from neighbour to neighbour, and in this way, down through generations. You looked at the chairs or spent time with the boatmaker, listened to the songs, and thus learned how to do and adapt for oneself. This is really the story of how things are kept alive and ad adapted for future use. And that really reflects what uh, Cloda had said at the introduction uh, to the, today's symposium. Uh, LOD's Corrib Crafts supplied many churches and pubs with furniture, including the three-legged chair. The first time I saw the tomb chair outside of the museum setting was in the ladies' toilet at Keene's Pub in Marm Bridge in Connemara, County Galway. The owner told me that the last one that was the last one they had. The others they owned had all been stolen. This photo shows two of LOD's chairs on the altar of St Mary's Church in Westport in County Mayo. Uh, so next time you're in an Irish Catholic church, have a look around and see if you can spot one. Keeping on the religious theme, in 2018, Irish Furniture, a church furnishing company based in County Leitrim, 
were tasked with making a chair for the visit of Pope Francis to Ireland for the World Meeting of Families event at Knox Shrine in County Mayo. Managing Director for ICS Furniture, Gavin Dignan commented, the brief for the chair was to create an understated modest kitchen fam family kitchen chair. My inspiration for the design was a traditional Irish three-legged chair. He added, from the outset, Pope Francis has been a humble man and I felt it important that the chair too would be understated. The chair is currently on display at Knock Museum, along with the chair crafted for the visit of Pope John Paul II in 1979. The difference in styles of the two chairs is quite remarkable and I highly recommend a visit in person. And lastly, this last image may be entering flights of fantasy. I present to you a stylized version of the old Irish chair at the Council of Elrond in the Lord of the Rings. My thanks to my former lecturer at GMIT uh, Mayo campus, Dr. Yvonne McDermott, for this reference. And to start finishing up, uh, finally, last year, I purchased my own tomb chair from Joyce's Craft Shop in Recess in Connemara in County Galway last year. Mark Joyce, the owner of Joyce's Craft Shop, had come across a Corrib Crafts chair from about the 1970s. He commissioned Francis Dowd, the son of Tom Dowd, who you saw in the photograph earlier, to make a version of the chair for, the, for their shop, uh, for a crafts chair, and the Joyce's chair, the Joyce's crafts chair is still there if you want it. My daughter was with me um, when I bought the chair, and you can see uh, the text she sent to her siblings um, in the third image there. Uh, so to finish off now, um, the IL Irish Chair Exhibition will be on display at the National Museum of Ireland Country Life uh, until March 2023. Rosa Meehan has curated a beautiful exhibition uh, with much more, of course, than I have been able to talk about today. I do hope you can come and see it. If not, there is an online exhibition on the museum website, museum.ie. However, if you do make it to County Mayo to see the exhibition in person, please make sure you do um, come up to me and say hello. Thanks very much. Barbara, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And um, and so many people will have seen, will be looking now at the Lord of the Rings. And But Tolkien had spent some time in our in the West of Ireland. So I'm, maybe he did spot that. Maybe he he already thought of that. But, um, but yeah, thank you so much, Barbara, for stepping in at such short notice and doing such a wonderful talk. Um, so now... Um, the, our two Scotsmen, um, are, <laughs> thanks, you're going to talk to us about the Quacquatore legacy, um, Stephen Jackson and David Jones. Um, so please go ahead, because I'm sure I'm not saying it right, and um, we want to listen to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, yes, I'm Stephen Jackson. Um, and I'm a senior curator of furniture at the National Museum. I'm going to be joined by David Jones. Um, formerly at the University of St Andrews. Um, and we're going to be talking about the Cacatoa chair, um, a French word, a French chair that came to Scotland um, and then uh, had an incredibly long, uh, persistent, uh, traditional influence in Scottish furniture making. Um, so we're going to be giving um, two halves of this uh, talk and uh, one will um, I will, I will look at the arrival of the chair in Scotland up until around 1700, and David will take the story from around 1700 onwards. Um, I'm not gonna offer any uh, much in the way of structural analysis of the physicality of it. I'm hoping um, some of that will come out with the slides, um, but I think it will uh, bring around the ideas of, of, of how traditions evolve um, and, and ideas about national and regional identity that go along with that. Um, so then, <clears throat> here we have three Kakatoa chairs, tall, narrow, with flared seats and clasping arms. Or rather, not, since in the 16th century France, the word Kakatoa, which derives from the noise that hens make, as to say clucking, uh, this word referred to small, upholstered chairs of a sort used by wealthy Parisian gentlewomen. It was only in the 19th century uh, when early French furniture scholars were trying to match antique things with the words they found in old documents, particularly house inventories, that the chairs here were given that name. Another misnomer, cacateurs, which in 16th century France meant a gossip, a woman gossips rather than a chair for gossiping in, was also affixed to the chairs that we're looking at now, 
um, by mid, mid 19th century collectors and dealers. Um, now this confusion about the, the word and the thing was beginning to be cleared up by the 1880s, um, but the, the, it's the association of the word cacatoire with this type of chair um, stuck, and it's now inevitable that we use that word. Um, ironically, we really do not know of any special word contemporary in the 16th century that describes the chairs you're looking at now. Who are these chairs for? They were probably normally intended for the use of noblemen during the reception of guests or for use in their closets and studies. In France in 1560, this was not a traditional chair. It was a fashionable innovation. This is design led by eyes adapting to Italian classicism, hands drawing on paper, as well as turning and carving in walnut. The extensive use of finely carved walnut was new, as was the routine combination of bench skills, that's to say joinery, turning and carving, the routine combination of such skills with design of forethought, the manipulation on paper of ideas and motifs from printed sources. The example in the centre is from the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris, and the one on the right from the V&A in London, although both were originally in the same 19th century antiquarian collection. And then the one on the left is from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and was made in oak somewhere in the Netherlands. And as will rapidly become apparent, <coughs> on arrival in a different place among different people, forms and fashioning take on new characteristics. Individuality is inevitable. The new fashion spread within France from Paris and the Loire Valley to remoter regions such as the Auvergne, where the piece on the left incorporating both oak and walnut was made. It even reached England, where in Salisbury at the right, a tradition was established associated with two generations of the Beckham family, working from the 1580s into the 1650s. Salisbury chairs combined the French features of a trapezoidal seat and arms that are bent in the horizontal plane with more standard English ones. The backs are not particularly narrow and the seat overlaps the rails in the manner you seldom see on French or indeed Scottish chairs. This one in the V&A's British galleries is made entirely of oak, though two others made by the Beckhams for the mayors of Salisbury in 1585 and 1622 were of imported walnut. Suffice to explain that Salisbury's merchants grew rich exporting woolen cloth to London and Antwerp and could easily have obtained imported walnut and isolated examples of French walnut furniture. But what of Scotland? Perhaps the earliest appearance of cacatoir elements in Scotland is here on the left, a chair made for the Countess of Mar in around 1570. A.M. is, is Annabella Murray, who had married the, um, the Earl of Mar. She was the wife of, of, of the Earl of Mar, the regent, who had managerial responsibility for the physical welfare of the infant King James VI. So this is the court style in full flourish, albeit in oak. Um, it's being cut down at the feet. On the right, dated 1588, this chair was made for the Earl of Gowrie, again, pretty well in, in the highest noble circles. Now the fret cut seat rails are a common Scottish feature, not something you would see um, on a French chair. So already this uh, design has been taken from the French walnut examples with their generally thin, and it's getting that slightly bit heavier using oak is diverging already, but becomes its own very well established style in Scotland. Well, I, I mean, I myself have examined over a hundred of these chairs. Many bear dates and heraldry from the younger brother of the Earl of Lith Linlithgow in 1606, that's the one directly to the right of the map, um, to say a wealthy merchant like David Wade of Anstruther on the coast of Fife. Uh, 1628, which is the uh, larger one on, on the left. Many of these chairs incorporate classical motifs of the sort that would be found in pattern books or engraved metalwork, book binding, all the fashionable, fashionable possessions of the elite. But they only come from within a certain geographical area, um, the highlit uh, pink blob there. That's to say along and inland of the eastern seaboard. Without entering into uh, the detail of this, chairs from the central uh, west of Scotland, Provenance, um, up now, 
uh, say Glasgow or Ayrshire are of an entirely different form during this period. Now, one hotbed of the Kakatoa tradition was the thriving mercantile city of Aberdeen with its direct con uh, connections to the continent. This pair of chairs were made in around 1597 for Alexander Burnett and Catherine Gordon of Crathis Castle, 15 miles inland of Aberdeen. You'll note that Catherine's heraldry and family name are independently marked on her chair. This signifies the importance of kinship in Scottish society, however, rather than some absence of patriarchy during the period. The Aberdeen civic tradition is famously evidenced by no less than 15 examples at Trinity Hall, the home of Aberdeen's incorporated trades or craft guilds. The one on the left was made in 1627 for the merchant Alexander Farquhar, and the one on the right in 1661 for the incorporation of fleshers at the expense of their deacon, Andrew Watson. Uh, the very latest Aberdeen example I've seen is dated 1696. The Flesher's chair, fascinatingly, is made from mahogany or another red-coloured tropical hardwood. And this is testimony to Aberdeen's established position within the European Atlantic economy and indeed the emerging transatlantic British Empire. Um, I, should, I should hasten to add that the French uh, Cacatoa chair had more or less died out by about 1600. So a very uh, relatively very short lived uh, tradition in France but once established in Scotland, um, these chairs are being made for a 130, 140 year period. By the mid 17th century, the Kakatoa was being copied by the joiners of rural Aberdeenshire, usually in native pine wood. The chair on the right is dated 1684 and alongside the four large thistles are smaller representations of wheat sheaves, a sack and a hammer, which I suspect are the preferred emblems of a patriotic miller expressing agricultural prosperity in place of martial inheritance or mercantile wealth. The Scottish Kakatoa came in regionally distinct variations. Several chairs from Kincardineshire have consistently narrow backs and these sort of Mickey Mouse ears, while chairs from Fife are much more compact and repeat a distinctive set of carved details. Gaelic speaking Perthshire had its own rough and ready tradition on the right hand side there, uh, left hand side. Now, uh, finally, I want to return to the west of Scotland and Ulster. The chair on the left, dated 1671, resembles a country made chair from Aberdeenshire, but it was acquired by the Ulster Folk Museum as part of a collection formed by a donor in Newton Arts. It came without any provenance, so we can't know for how long it had been in County Down. The arms that scroll in a vertical plane and run down vertically from the styles to the front posts in the standard English manner here feel like replacements. <coughs> they don't sit terribly happily on the front posts. However, chairs from Ulster that have strong cultural connections to Scotland tend to exhibit not only this sort of arm, but other features belonging to an entirely different 17th and early 18th century tradition. These chairs have twin vertical back panels and a conventional square frame construction. As an example, uh, in the middle at the top, uh, now also in the collection of the Ulster Folk Museum, this was owned by a family of Scottish settlers in Ballymoney, County Antrim. Twin panel backs are unusual in England, but are not uncommon on chairs from Scotland, including many from the southwest, such as the one on the lower right at the museum in Dumfries. They're also found on the Isle of Man, as in the black and white photo at the bottom in the centre. And finally, they are even found in chairs that might otherwise have been classed as late vernacular expressions of the Kakatoa style at the top right from the NMS collection dated 1671 and probably from Aberdeenshire. So there we have the horizontally curving arms on a double uh, twin panel back. So um, I'm, I'm in conclusion, this particular aspect of how um, features of different traditions can migrate is, I have to say, fairly unclear at the present time. But David is now going to take the story on through the 18th and 19th centuries into the 20th century. Lovely. Thanks, Stephen. I'm David Jones and I'm a furniture historian in Fife. Um, 
I, as Stephen, uh, uh, I think, said, um, the, um, the Kakatoa chair survived uh, right through into the 18th century. And although the design's heyday it was in the late 16th and the very early 17th centuries, examples made in the 1680s and 90s are certainly not uncommon. And several uh, Kakatoas exist bearing original dates um, after 1700, such as the chair on the left-hand side. Plain panel chairs of the Kakatoa shape are fairly common in uh, northeast Scotland, Aberdeenshire in particular. But the most enduring element of the Kakatoa chair seems to have been its exaggerated serpentine arm, which lingered as a feature of chairs from the eastern uh, seaboard throughout the 18th and the 19th centuries. And this early mid 19th early to mid 19th century chair on the right hand side from Fife um, displays influence um, interestingly from both um, uh, the Kakatoa tradition and uh, Hepplewhite's uh, guide of 1788 in, in its, um, its multiple um, banister at the back and um, a, a curved cresting rail. So it's a peculiar hybrid of the atavistic uh, 17th century, 16th century, 17th century Kakatoa style and a later 18th century pattern book. But the um, uh, distinctive uh, and enduring feature are the flat arms with that rhythmic curve supported on baluster turn posts terminating in circular hands, which we know from the earlier Kakatoa tradition. Um, but awareness of the significance of the Kakatoa tradition as an historic or even as a peculiarly Scottish type didn't surface uh, uh, really again until the early 18th and early 19th century. Um, connection with royalty was one of the main reasons for the survival of historic Scottish furniture, the physical survival of it. An association with Mary Queen of Scots was certainly the biggest draw. Um, much of course was fake uh, and had no proven provenance, but a small group of items that has ha ha had as good a claim as any to have any authentic link with Mary Queen of Scots was her nursing furniture, the nursing furniture used by her with her son James, later James VI of Scotland. And Stephen has mentioned um, that chair earlier on, and that was the Countess of Mars nursing chair. Um, it shows the chair in a front side and rear, um, um, uh, rear views as sketched here by a man called Walter Geeky, who was a profoundly deaf um, artist in early 19th century Edinburgh. And he, um, he did sketch uh, several Kakatoa chairs, but this is his most uh, clear rendition, I think, of a particular chair, the Countess of Mars nursing chair, done about 1830. Um, and in making what is quite clearly a record drawing, one that would have enabled a craftsman to reproduce the piece with reasonable accuracy, um, and even showing little details like the repairs um, that, it, that it had experienced. Um, Geeky, perhaps inadvertently, had become, I think, the first Scottish furniture historian. He was certainly the earliest known artist to make a precise visual record of a Scottish Kakatoa chair. To future, gen to future generations, the Countess of Mars chair displayed all the distinctive attributes that we've come to associate with the Kakatoa, a narrow panel back um, rising to an elaborate cresting, uh, wide enclosing arms and trapezoidal seat. And these are the features that, that made it seem uh, in the early 19th century, so strongly Scottish uh, st stylistic elements that were to re-enter our decorative vocabulary in succeeding decades. By the time the uh, 19th century furniture historian, John Small, um, who was born in 1851, came to illustrate uh, the Countess of Mars nursing chair in the top left-hand uh, illustration of his volume of lithographic um, depictions of Scottish furniture in 1883, 
Um, he was apparently unaware of its, of its 16th century pedigree or its royal significance. He described it simply as a Jacobean chair from Alloa, where the Countess, where the, where the Earl of Mar lived. But he did show it alongside another cacatoire, uh, the large illustration on the right-hand side, the Flesher's chair from the Trinity Hall collection in Aberdeen. And um, although not referring to the type of chair by name, that is cacatoire, um, he seemed to have the, uh, the knowledge that these two chairs shared distinctive characteristics. And there's the Flesher's chair that um, Stephen talked about in mahogany or similar wood uh, on the lower right and the Earl of Mars, the Countess of Mars nursing chair on the upper right. In his other major publication, um, Scottish Furniture and Woodwork, published in 1878, um, John Small had illustrated another small cacatoire chair, this time in a public collection um, from the McFarlane Museum in, in Stirling. Um, a chair that had been once in the possession of the Earl of Guthrie. Uh, Small went on to produce a version of this at his, uh, his own factory, the North British Art Furniture Works, Wallace Street in Stirling, from around 1885. And it was the People's Journal, a local newspaper of, of, 19, of 1888, who seemed to um, coin the, the term gossip chair. Um, they said, gossip chairs are a favorite speciality of Mr. Small's. They are low, comfortable, inviting looking things. Um, a great deal of ingenuity and artistic skill being lavished on the woodwork of the back. And it seems uh, that they were a version of, of Guthrie's um, chair. Um, the term cacateurs, um, which, uh, again, as Stephen mentioned, um, is, a, 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 is a slightly misogynistic term, to, to, to meaning um, a woman who chatters um, uh, from the verb cacate, um, first appeared in print, it seemed, in the Cabinet Maker and Art Furniture of 1890, Art Furniture of 1891, certainly the first in an English language publication, and uh, seems to have been prompted by interest in the French precedent from Paris in the Exhibition Universelle of 1889. By the end of the 19th century, the cacatoire, or cacateurs, was finding its place in antiquarian interiors, particularly those in the so-called Scots baronial style. An interesting sort of dilemma uh, that um, many architects were designing houses with um, turrets and um, um, uh, asymmetrical um, architectural details. Uh, and um, this was informed by a number of pattern books. Architects like David Bryce, for instance, um, specializing in Scots baronial houses. But uh, finding furniture for them was a bit of a, um, a, another matter. And um, but it does seem that there was a corresponding fashion for uh, um, oak furniture in these houses. Um, and some of it collected from uh, uh, Scottish historical sources. And this is one of them, one example. This is a, a chair acquired locally in Fife by the, the Duncan family, who made an oak bedroom in, their, in the Scot style in their house, Norton House in Fife in 1895. They had a great oak bed, a cabinet, panel press, cupboards, uh, cane back chairs copied from examples at Holyrood, and a locally acquired chair that you see here. It's all right if you could get one. Uh, they were scarce um, e even then. Uh, and so the alternative was to make one yourself. And uh, this corresponded with the craze for hand carving at the time, which was not only a Scottish thing, it happened in England and all over the place. In the 1890s, um, you either, you either uh, uh, were taught by a, um, um, a, mass, a carving expert uh, 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 and you got your blanks and, and carve your details um, on a piece of furniture or you made it yourself. This is one made by a lady called Miss Sybil Berry of Tayfield House in the north of Fife, 1894. 
and uh, it seems that she has actually copied some, at least some little details of local carving um, that was reasonably plentiful in the area at the time. A reviewer of um, John Small's Scottish Woodwork in um, writing in a, a, a journal called The Architect and Contract Reporter in 1899 um, referred to the fact that uh, uh, to its value um, to um, that large body of natives, Scots natives scattered abroad, to whom he said the least thing that is Scottish appeals with irresistible force. And 200 copies of um, John Small's um, book uh, were certainly sent to America and where they seem to have had a certain, enjoyed a certain amount of circulation. Uh, and this is an interesting page from the design scrapbook of a firm called A.H. Davenport and Company of Brooklyn and New York, made between 1885 and 1900. And as you can see, uh, there are what seem to be at least tracings from John Small's publications. Uh, at the top left, three cacatoa chairs, the middle left, uh, a very um, prominent depiction of the Flesher's chair that we've seen already uh, two or three times from Aberdeen. Um, A.H. Davenport were a very influential company. Uh, they um, had branches in uh, New York and Brooklyn, as I've just mentioned, and they worked with leading architects such as H.H. Uh, Richardson, McKim, Mead and White, and Peabody and Stearns on the interior design of buildings. Um, this company scrapbook shown here was designed by their in-house, was made by their in-house designer, Francis Bacon. Um, and um, it's interesting that around, just after this uh, tear sheet um, um, was used by that company, uh, makers such as um, um, the Green brothers, Green and Green, Charles Sumner Green and his brother, Henry May the Green um, in California were um, making rather elegant abstracted versions of the Kakatoa chair. This example was made for the dining room of the Blacker House in Pasadena, California between 1907 and 1909. Um, but a few years earlier, um, our own Charles Rennie McIntosh, uh, born in 1868, um, can be credited with the reintroduction, I think, of the Kakatoa chair into the drawing room of Scottish houses. This is his chair for, his armchair for Windy Hill at Kilmahome, um, and it uh, dates from between 1901 and 1902. He made several versions of the uh, Kakatoa chair at this time, including uh, chairs for Mrs. Rowett at Kingsborough Gardens in Glasgow, and this one for um, um, for William Davidson at Windy Hill, um, which um, which house is still privately owned and uh, has furniture um, to this specification in its interior. But I think by simplifying the design, uh, at least by simplifying the design seen in pattern books such as John Small's and so on, um, uh, and making the construction lighter, uh, eliminating any carved detail. He made the chair suitable for a modern domestic and even possibly feminine room. But certain Kakatoa signature features, such as the trapezoidal seat and the broad flat arms, were firmly retained. And the Windy Hill chair that you see here received international exposure at an exhibition such as Moscow in um, 1903. And I'd like to think that this is a sort of example of um, Scottish mannerism. Uh, early, late 16th, early 17th century Scottish mannerism that that that, that, that Macintosh took on. Um, his contemporary, um, slightly very slightly earlier contemporary George Walton, also from Glasgow, born in 1867, made his own versions of the Kakatoa, and like Charles Rennie Macintosh, made strong play of the original design defining features of the chair type. His round tree cafe chair seen here, made for an English client um, for, um, uh, the, um, for a cafe in Scarborough in Yorkshire, um, 
between 1895 and 18, 1896 has more of the squat dimensions of a fife cacatoire than Macintosh's tall backed chairs, so perhaps no Aberdeen mannerism here. But, but both men, uh, in a nod to the current English arts and crafts style, uh, specified rush seats for their cacatoires, um, not um, a Scottish feature, um, but a sort of hybrid idea. Um, George Walton's Abingwood chair, which was an, an evolution of the Roundtree Cafe chair, dating from 1898, um, received greater European exposure, being bought for a museum collection in Norway by the curators there, the very forward-looking curators, and then specified for the interiors of the new Kodak photographic shops in major European cities. And it's probably this exposure that um, made the distinctive form of the Scottish cacatoire chair um, certainly visible to other designers, people like Richard Riemerschmidt, um, who produced this design uh, um, in Germany in 1909. The, shaped, uh, uh, the shape of it is, is clearly um, allied to the, to the cacatoire shape, trapezoidal seat, uh, enclosing arms. I think the, the back design probably owes more to sort of Alpine, uh, Central European um, piercing, uh, pierced designs, but anyway, an interesting hybrid that possibly owes a debt to Walton's um, to Walton's own designs of the 1890s. But arguably, the most scholarly and by association conservative of the early 20th century Scottish revivalists of the cacatoire, I think, was um, the, the the Fife designer Robert Lorimer, who was born in 1864, and this is um, his much more traditional cacatoire design made for the estate office of um, a Fife estate called Balcarres in 1904. A very informed facsimile of a chair dated 1618, originally made for one of the baileys or um, local councillors of the nearby royal borough of St. Monans. It has characteristic e East Nuke of Fife, that is Northeast Fife um, carving motifs, the, the angled palmettes in the cresting the fleshy rosette in the centre, um, um, uh, and the, the rather sort of confident uh, acanthus flourishes of the, of the upper cresting rail too, including these peculiar sheafs of corn motifs in the central panel, I think are, are uh, characteristic of, um, of Fife. So a very firm Scots identity to this chair, um, perhaps unlike Walton, um, who didn't really, um, promote the Scottish identity of the cacatoire. It was simply to him modern design. Um, and um, Lorimer even chose to make it out of Scots oak with a very distinctive grain. Um, the later 20th century, um, I think was a very lean period for the cacatoire legacy. And although it did linger on, it, um, it lingered on very faintly. Few makers, um, after the Second World War, certainly, it seems, retained any detailed knowledge of the type, as Lorimer obviously had, and there was little demand for the form as domestic furniture. Only, I think, the woodcraft revival of the 1980s and 1990s, inspired by the work of the Japanese-American maker George Nakashima, and represented in a somewhat diluted manner in Scotland by Tim Stead and his followers, preserved a faint memory of the cacatoire shape, deployed by those who wanted, consciously or not, to give their chairs a Celtic feeling. <laughs> and this is something that we should perhaps talk about uh, afterwards. You know, is the cacatoire uh, a Celtic thing at all? And what does that mean? Inevitably, in these woodcraft revival chairs, no reference was made to historical examples, nor to pattern book sources. I should show an example of a bad cacatoire here, but I, I don't have one to show you. Uh, um, however, there was a, a quiet rediscovery of the cacatoire or cacatoire's chair by furniture historians in articles and exhibitions and examples of such chairs as the Trinity Hall um, seats in Aberdeen became once again more widely known. A chair such as the new cacatoire made for a museum 
um, old gala house in Gala Shields by Nigel Bridges in 2002 is an instance of this more informed resurgence uh, in, the, in the 21st century. Happily, uh, the 21st century has been has seen a, a renaissance for the Scottish cacatoire, and contemporary makers are finding a renewed interest in its authentic form. Um, Angus Ross from Aberfeldy is a very good example, um, one of, of, of several, and his range of elegant chairs made from native hardwoods with modern convenience and comfort in mind um, show um, the, 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 the survival of the cacatoire tradition. These uncompromisingly contemporary chairs exploit the cacatoire's um, uh, design qualities that were mentioned by, uh, by, by Cloder and Rosa and uh, um, sculptural qualities too, whilst being fully informed of the type's historical legacy. Um, thanks very much, and I hope I haven't uh, uh, intruded too much into Claudia's time. Thanks so much, David, and thanks so much, Stephen. Um, we've learned so much, and it's wonderful. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, do not disturb, but the, the, it actually keeps on ringing, so sorry about that. Um, but just thank you very much, and it's wonderful. It's like that you have revisited the there's, there's since Macintosh and Walton, but also these... Um, the tradition has been revisited um, and it's wonderful that there's the lovely modern versions as well. Um, but thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful. And now it's um, Claudia, Dr. Claudia Kinmuth, and um, it's lovely to welcome you, um, Claudia. And as everyone knows, I think everyone knows of you as well. And um, you're um, the author of Irish Country Furniture and Woodcrafts, um, 1700 to 2000, of which I... I had to do a wonderful review. Um, I reviewed it and I loved reading it. So, um, but just you're going to talk today and you had already looked at these chairs for your first book in 92, 93 and in your original research. And also, I suppose you're also a maker, Claudia, but I'm going to leave it over to you. And thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, Claudia, for that kind introduction and for everybody behind the scenes for this organisation. Um, and it's really fascinating to listen to Stephen Jackson and David Jones talking about the, um, the related chairs in Scotland and in France. Um, this afternoon, briefly, I'm, I'm going to try and concentrate on the Irish chairs, which you can see here. The ones in the National Museum, I think there are 13 of the early ones, and we can see them here on my first slide in the exhibition, which um, tantalizingly I only really visited incredibly briefly for about an hour and I wasn't able to photograph when I was there for the opening of the ex exhibition. But there it is in Mayo and I'm going to look at um, the Sligo chairs construction, uh, its variation and its late evolution um, this afternoon. And just to remind people who aren't familiar with my work, um, I wrote a book in 1993, Irish Country Furniture, 1700 to 1950. Then I moved into looking at Irish genre painting, which is the book that you can see in the middle, Irish Royal Interiors in Art, which I published in 2006. And then more recently, my, my latest um, enlarged book, Irish Country Furniture and Furnishings, 1700 to 2000. So this afternoon, I'm going to look at the Sligo chair um, in art and as an object. And I'm going to use this interdisciplinary approach, which um, has always been one that I very much enjoy. Now, trying to think about where it was just distributed, um, I go back to the early sources, which um, I came across uh, in, in, in 1987, when I was starting to research this. So we have the Dublin Penny Journal on the top left of your screen, which shows a very curious drawing. I mean, it's really hard to, figure out how accurate that drawing is, but it does look like it has a T-shaped seat and um, a single board back. And it's described by the journalist in 1832 as an ancient Irish chair. Um, and it's three-legged, of course, which is how we come across it in Ireland. And then, of course, we've got another version on the top of the screen by Peter Parley, who's again from about that period, 1830, he's publishing a book, which I'm, I'm never quite sure, actually, if he's 
copying the Dublin Penny Journal or not, but he says he's come across this chair in Drumcliff, and you can just see my yellow arrow showing where these particular chairs are. And then the, the wonderful Mrs. Hall, he's written three heavy volumes all about the whole of Ireland from the 1840s, which most historians are very familiar with. And she doesn't often discuss furniture, but here she, she talks about this chair that she says is very commonly used throughout Connacht. And I'm just grabbing a copy of my book here to quote what she what she says, um, that it was in a three bay house um, with people in the cottage, as she calls it, consisting of a father, mother, grandmother, seven children, a dog and a cat and half a dozen laying hens. So it's a, you know, it's a humble house. Um, and she said this particular house contained indeed nearly every article of furniture in use in such dwellings of the humbler classes. Each of them we had often seen, but very seldom had been able to notice them altogether. The first object that attracted our attention was a singularly primitive chair, very commonly used throughout Connacht. It's roughly made of elm, the pieces being nailed together, and that puzzles me that bit, as may be seen by the accompanying print. And she goes on to say there's evidence that this piece of furniture has undergone little change during the last eight or ten centuries. Well, we're not quite sure what, she, what she's basing that on. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration per, personally, but I'll go on to the next slide. And here we've got a chair that we already um, saw mentioned. It's one of the 13 or chairs in the National Museum's collection by Thomas Durkin with his, um, his stamp that he stamped five times all over this very heavy chair. And this is, of course, a side chair rather than an armchair. So we've got, you know, the side chair and the armchair are the two main types that we come across in the west of Ireland. And he was a chairmaker, a cooper, a joiner. And as we heard earlier, he was always he was also um, involved in shipbuilding. And um, the idea is that this stamp came from shipbuilding, although other chairmakers would certainly use this type of stamp if they're stamping their names on chairs. So his chair comes from. Um, County Mayo, where that little star is. And here I put it on the map, along with um, a couple more that turned up recently from Sligo, top right, a pair of them by the same maker, I suspect, which I haven't been able to examine because of the pandemic. And then we've got the 13 chairs um, represented by the green star in Tuam. Six of the, of the National Museum chairs are from Tuam, and the others really have no accession. So Less than half of them are attributed to Tuam. Um, so they have a bit of distribution there. Now I'm going to talk briefly about construction because it's helpful to, um, to try and categorise them a bit. But based on only these 13 examples or so, you know, frustratingly, unlike um, our Scottish furniture historians who've got, you know, so many lovely examples to discuss. I've just got this small quorum of pre-1950 chairs. So I photographed these three together when I was last in the National Museum of Ireland stores and I juxtaposed them deliberately. I chose three different types. On the right, you've got the side chair, as they're called, um, with no arms. And then on the left, the two examples with arms have got two very different forms of construction. And my next slide shows you have straight backs or raked backs. A raked back obviously has a curve and makes the chair considerably um, more comfortable, it's more stable, it's less likely to tip over. These chairs do have a tendency to tip over. And of course, they cost the furniture maker a lot more because a straight back is a, sing a single plank, but a, a curved back has to be cut from a much thicker block. There's no steam bending involved with these chairs. They're, they're cutting um, and sawing to create these shapes. So they are the differential types. Now, the next slide shows um, on the left, I'm just thinking about these two armchairs on the left. There's two main categories of armchairs. One's where the, um, the arm goes from the ground all the way up to, and the, the front leg goes all the way up in the centre with that green line supporting the armrest. Now that's a single support. Um, or on the far left, it's a leg which is separate to the armrest where you can see with those two yellow lines. Now I would suggest that all the other chairs that we've seen almost invariably in the last two talks have got that central form which is one support that goes from the ground up to the arm on the whole. All the Scottish ones and most of the French ones. Now the next slide shows the seats which are characterised by a T-shape 
construction, very curious construction, really. Um, quite unusual, luckily for us. And um, here I'm going to quote from Stephen Jackson's amazing article of nearly 100 pages on the Scottish Kakatoa chair. And he says, the Kakatoa chair with narrow back, trapezoidal seat and horizontal clasping arms is strongly associated with Scotland. Well, those three categories could easily apply to the, the Sligo chair as well. So the next slide shows this T-shaped structure underneath, which is again very much characteristic of the Irish Sligo chair. Um, and I put circles around the, the revealed construction, which we'll see a little bit more of as well. You can only have this T-shaped stretcher underneath joining the legs if you have a single leg at the back. So you very rarely find it in the Scottish or French examples. So I did spot it. I, I did spot one or two early on in the earlier one we saw, but they're exceptional. Now, now we're looking at the seats again, and you can see something that characterises the Sligo chair is honest construction. And us furniture historians talk about revealed or honest construction as construction which isn't hidden. You can see it, but it's also very strong. So in these seats, all the Sligo chairs have got these through wedged tenons, which come right through, um, wedges hold them in place, um, they're very robust, and they don't require any glue. Um, and the next slide of the seats shows you pegs tenons, which are another form of construction, which is um, revealed, strong. It's, um, you know, I've just put green lines to show you where the tenon is, and the, these little pegs, which are actually square pegs pushed into round holes for strength. Um, so that's nice to see that too, and the same down there. So this characterises all these chairs, and these forms of construction are actually common to medieval furniture too. Now this isn't my photograph, I'm being upstaged by a dog, but it is a photograph from a private collection of a pair of chairs, probably made by the same maker from Sligo, from Loch Nassul. Um, and it's nice, I haven't taken these pictures, but I've been sent them. And it's very interesting to see the way the arms on the example on the right have a bit of a curve, um, not an awful lot of curve because it's quite difficult to get a very big curve in one piece of wood and still have the strength. And you can see the weak point on the left. I'm pointing this out because you can actually see on the left-hand side where the back of the arms is breaking away and crumbling. Now, this is a common problem with these Sligo, Sligo chairs. They, they really, this is their very weak point. I mean, there's a little handhold at the back you can see there, which if people are sensible enough, they're using that to pick the chair up and not the arms. Um, you, you should really never pick up an, uh, an armchair by its arms anyway. But this is definitely a weak point that they're, they're, they're put into little um, slots and they are pegged, but they're still weak. Now, finally, the most interesting part of the construction is this tusk tenon, which is um, the, the central part of the seat goes through a mortise, which is another name for a hole in the back of the, of the back of the um, backboard, and it projects at the back really quite generously. It has to come through a long way or it's weak. And then um, another mortise has been made to insert a tusk. And this is what all these Sligo chairs have got this extraordinary tusked tenon. Um, and it's an interesting joint because it's one that was used in the late Middle Ages by people who wanted to dismantle their furniture and reassemble it without using any glue. You find it on tables um, quite often. So I love seeing this here because it's, um, you know, this chair didn't need any glue at all and it didn't need any nails or screws, as Durkin said when he was describing how he made his chair. Um, now I'm going to look at the theoretical origins of the Sligo chair, which are still theory, but um, here we've got the French cacatoire, as we've been told correctly to call it this morning, or gossip chairs. There's only a couple of examples. Um, sadly for us French historians, we need work on these French chairs. We, you know, we can only put together the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle of furniture if we have, you know, books and articles about foreign furniture that links with ours in Ireland or in Scotland. So I think it's interesting because the one on the right, you can see that T-shaped set stretcher appearing, even though it isn't got, uh, hasn't got a single board back. The one on the left has got a narrower back and it's got, they've both got these horizontal curved arms that Stephen Jackson discussed. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about this because I've been unable to examine an example. Um, 
except in the V&A, we've got one from 1535, which you can see there, it's the second one in the line. I'm, I'm showing a sort of a chronology, if you like, because I do think the, Fran the French cacatoire, actually, rather than cacateurs on the far left, is um, strongly linked to the Sligo one. And then that one from England, 1535, from the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, is pretty similar as well. And then we've got one of the Scottish ones from Aberdeen that we heard about this morning. And then on the right, <coughs> this one um, that we saw before um, from the National Museum. So, um, you know, this is where we think the Irish Sligo chair has evolved, is from these Scottish and French ones. And when I looked in the Irish Historic Time Atlas, published by the Royal Irish Academy, edited by Agrit Sims, um, I, I looked up Sligo and I thought to myself, you know, is Sligo really a place that's connected with anywhere else? And sure enough, um, in the 17th century and earlier, we have very strong connections with France. Um, a lot of wine was imported into Sligo. Sligo was an important port. It was importing wine, and I would suggest if it was importing wine, it would have imported French culture. And it was also very well connected to Eastern Scotland. In fact, it's probably better connected to France and Scotland than it was perhaps to Dublin or to England at that time. So that was wonderful to, to read that and learn about that. And more work needs to be done on that too. When I looked up Tuam, there were tenuous connections, but Tuam was, um, it, it kept being um, damaged by oh, all sorts of upheavals and uh, the, the connections are less strong in Tuam than they were in Sligo, as far as I could make out from this research. Now, going back to um, Dublin Penny Journal, we've got this curious picture that I showed you earlier on with this odd crest rail. And I wonder if there's something about these pierced crest rails that we've got in Scotland that is perhaps being um, sketched up here. Uh, and here's the one from the Ulster Folk Museum on the right that was mentioned. You know, there's, there is a wide cresting rail there for sure. Um, so that's a tenuous connection. And then of course, um, you know, that's as far as I'm going to go with uh, with the possible origins. I mean, I do think the Sligo chair is one that has three legs. It sits on it sits very firmly on uneven ground, which is an important thing in the Irish farmhouse that you don't have the chairs rocking about or breaking on rough ground or earthen floors or flagstone floors. So um, the three legs are perfectly suited to the Irish farmhouse, and that's maybe why you find it becomes fairly widespread, according to Mrs. Hall. Um, and other sources. Now here we've got the famous poet W.B. Yeats who um, restored his tower house in um, Tor Balalee, here you can see it on the left, between 1917 and 1928. And I, I can't find the drawings, I have got somewhere in my files of these chairs, but I think the architect had these made and these are all Sligo chairs of course, they're all arm chairs and they've got a dead straight back. So they're still there um, as far as I know and so that's one of the early iterations of it as a reproduction, I would say. Um, and then when I first started my research as a student, actually my professor at the Royal College of Art said to me that he'd seen, um, as it turned out, Sligo chairs hanging up outside an antique shop in Gort. And he said, um, you know, Claudia, why don't you go and investigate these extraordinary things that um, nobody's written about? So thinking about this this week, that was one of the first times I was told, go and have a look at this chair. And so when I headed off on my fieldwork around Ireland in um, 1987, I hunted down LOD and that's my photograph of him. And we talked about why he was reproducing the chairs that you can see in his factory on the left in small batches in tropical hardwoods. Um, and he, you know, you can see he was sitting on one in his house there and he liked to sit on it backwards. And he said, um, you know, this is a comfortable way to sit on it. And actually, if you think of that very, very wide seat board, it's that's probably the, the one of the most comfortable ways to sit on a, on a side chair like that. And he's holding a, an early example in his left hand and talking about it in an animated way. He wasn't running Corrib Crafts at that point anymore, but Corrib Crafts, I think, was, was set up by him in 1969. Um, and that's... Um, Vincent Killen on the left, um, finishing off one of the armchairs. And they're very much heavier. People reproducing chairs nearly always make them thicker and heavier than the originals. Um, so 
I when I was in the workshop, um, they had a couple of early ones. There's an early one on the left that they had sort of sitting around that they were using um, perhaps as as inspiration. And then these are a couple of ones that they made. And you can see at the bottom of that board, they've got this extra foot, which which people reproducing this chair who struggle with it put on there to stop it tipping over. So that's uh, definitely a late version rather than early one. And they're in uh, tropical hardwoods, of course. So now I'm going to turn briefly to um, this artist who I've been interested in for a very long time called Howard Helmick. Um, he was very good. He was very good Irish genre painter. He he was trained in Paris in the in the salon. He was American, but his time in Paris um, taught him to be a good social realistic painter. And most of his paintings of Ireland date from the 1870s and 1880s. I'm just showing you on the left, highlighted in blue, the titles that we know he exhibited at London's Royal Academy and a couple of titles that he exhibited in Dublin at the Royal Hibernian Academy. And when I look at the titles, um, I can, you know, sometimes I can match it to the paintings that come up at auction, um, which I also look at. And it also tells us where he lived. So there's Howard Helmick himself. Um, and so, one of the paintings which is very interesting to us today, I'm only going to show a few, is called A Difference of Opinion from 1882. Um, Helmick worked in studios near Galway, Dangan Cottage, and down in, here where I live um, in County Cork, in West Cork, he, and he lived, he had a studio in Kinsale actually. So this chair on the left is clearly a Sligo chair, I'm sure you can now recognise it yourselves and he's put it in the foreground he's very interested in it but what intrigues me you can see the tusked tenon is that this is the only example that we are able to look at that has these turned spindles supporting the arm and I've already said that the arm rests were delicate in these chairs but I suppose these turned spindles um, turned on a lathe uh, I hope you can see that just there two of them are under each arm and another one supporting the front, they would have given a bit more solidity to this very weak joint at the back. So Helmick's showing us an example of a chair, which if you like is extinct, um, but there it is in a painting from 1882. And um, there you can see it more closely um, for the next slide with the tusk tenon again, just to remind you of that extraordinary tusk tenon, which Helmick, I think it seems to be interested in as well. It's so similar, it's so lovely to see that painted so clearly and there you've got um one of the national museum chairs on the right with a huge tusk holding it together um so helmick's paintings can be categorized if you like his galway paintings and his court paintings and whenever i see him feature one of these chairs i say well he must be painting up in up in galway from dangan cottage and this particular painting which is um the interior of an Irish cabin, I think it's called. Um, you can see how this chair leans back. This is again a Sligo chair, of course, and it's got these turned supports. It's got quite a straight back, not completely straight, but it's, it reminds me of the way this one inclines on the right with this sort of leaning back, which um, is a bit curious. And then this is a lovely painting by Helmut that um, is difficult to talk about quickly because it's so complicated and so, um, revealing of Irish marriage traditions and arranged marriage. But the, the curious thing about it is you've got the bride coming in. It's called Bringing Home the Bride. Is that the, the father, the groom's father, is sitting on a Sligo chair. I've just juxtaposed one there with a T-shaped stretcher, three legs. And um, the bride's young sister, who that is over there on the right, has another one behind her. So this is definitely West of Ireland this painting um, and it shows the flagstone floor, which I've already mentioned, you know, is quite damaging to four legged chairs and perfect if you have a three legged chair, particularly a robust one like the Sligo chair. Now, another one of, of Helmick's paintings shows, um, I think it's probably a solicitor or a lawyer um, and he's sitting sideways on, an, on, a, on a side chair, a side Sligo chair <coughs> but with no arms, excuse me. So a little bit like LOD sitting backwards, he's he's able to sit sideways on it and use use the top of the back crest as a somewhere to put his arm. So and you can see the tusk tenon there as well in Helmick's painting. 
and another one here which is um called the unexpected visitor there's again a narrative to that painting on the left um she's a widow she's lost her husband and after a year traditionally she could think about remarrying um we know this because there's an unlit candle there she'd have lit the candle for a year so helmick is um is leaving this empty chair in the foreground i think to suggest um this woman's department and this is the the suitor who's come to visit her so it's rather a lovely interplay the chair being used um to symbolize somebody who's died and symbolize the place that that could be the place of the next husband perhaps so um again that's one of helmick's west of ireland paintings and on the right another one the schoolmaster's moment of leisure from the 1880s and the schoolmaster again is sitting on this chair i hope you can begin to see how i can I can spot these chairs. Um, you can just see the arm there with its turned armrest. So he's clearly seeing um, these chairs. I mean, it's possible he's got one in his studio. I am open to that suggestion because artists did use artists' license um, and they use props and they use props repeatedly. Um, but we're very unlikely to find one of those chairs down in, in, in Kinsale in Cork. Uh, that's for sure. I've never seen one down here. So um, this, is, um, this is interesting. The Connemara Postman by an artist who had a lot of aliases, um, but she's calling herself J. Lizzie Cloud here. And it's called the Connemara Postman. I, I, I really, really like this simple genre painting um, of the grandmother having the letter read out to her by the postman. But it's interesting behind... The little boy dressed as a girl is an, um, a side chair, a Sligo side chair. Now, the curious thing about this is that um, going on to the next, that Lizzie Cloud was actually um, having a love affair with Howard Helmick, which I discovered after doing quite a lot of sleuthing and noticing they have the same address. So you can see on the left, Dank and Cottage Galway there in, in yellow, and there up at the top of Lizzie Cloud's exhibited titles, Dank and Cottage Galway. So it was only when I spotted that they were exhibiting from the same address. I thought, gosh, you know, this is a terribly interesting um, secret affair going on. But that's another story anyway. Um, finally, looking at um, an anonymous painting that turned up oh, about five years ago and is now in the connection in, in um, America, Quinnipiac. This is an anonymous painting and it's called the Connemara Spinner. And of course, you can see the spinner as she she is sitting spinning flax at a treadle wheel but there's quite a well-appointed cottage i mean a little bit like hall's description it's got everything you would expect including this chair and again this painter is showing us the back of it it's a very straight back it's got the t-shaped stretcher um getting a bit closer you can see um i think the interesting thing about spinners is they need to move their arms around so it's very handy for a spinner to have a narrow back chair Spinner's chairs traditionally are narrowed at the back to allow this arm movement. So um, I, I think that's interesting now. That helps place that painting in the west of Ireland for sure. And there I think the, the father or the, you know, the farmer is probably also sitting on a version of a Sligo chair in the background. Now, finally, and I'm going to stop because I've run out of time. Um, very recently, during the pandemic, when I wasn't able to go out and knock on doors, um, somebody sent me this picture on the right from Galway. And the first thing that sprung to mind was, well, we've got the, the Sugon chair on the left. That's the traditional version of a Sugon chair, the orange one. Um, but this is a very different one. And I just thought to myself, oh, it's like a chair. Look at that. That's what maybe somebody has seen. They found one piece of wood to create this extraordinary back. Um, I don't know if it's a one off or not, but there it is. It's um, It's kind of fun and interesting to join up the dots between different designs but I would say that's a, a vernacular chair which is uh maybe it's not a one-off perhaps there were more than one but um there it is and of course I've missed out a lot there's lots of new iterations of these chairs particularly by people like Sasha Sykes and um Laura Mays who were very fortunate to be able to include in today's event and I'm really looking forward to seeing what she has to say um, and, and various other people. I haven't really taken it up beyond about um, 1935 or 1950 in terms of recent chairs. Um, so I, I'd also like to add this, if anybody else has a Sligo chair who's um, listening to this talk, I'd be very interested to see it. I think there are many, many in private collections. I know that Muriel Gahan had 
two of them when I went to see her um, in the late 1980s. And I don't know what's happened to her chairs. I'd love to see them, but they were nice examples. Haven't got photographs of them, sadly. So I'd love it if anybody could contact me on my website, which you've got down there, bottom left in blue, um, or via my Twitter account. Um, any any other Sligo chairs, which I think are extraordinarily rare and, and need to be preserved and um, are of great interest. And thank you very much. I'll stop now. Thanks so much, Claudia. That was absolutely wonderful and really brilliant. I thought your sleuthing and the detective work you did for Lizzie and Helmick, that's really fascinating. That's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I thought it was really wonderful. And, you know, I and I know that when you see these, one of the names for the exhibition I thought would be Three Legs Good, you know, because it's, it's like two legs bad, four legs bad, three legs good. Um, yeah. And and so many of our other objects, um, like trivets and different hearth related material, they're all three legged um, because of uneven floors. Um, and also just looking at the slides and thinking back to um, Stephen and David's presentation, arms or no arms, I, I think no arms seems much easier for so many things. And even, you know, musicians now, it's it's always looking, everyone, a lot of people hate the armchair and, you know, they just can't do as many things in it. But it's, I do find it's quite interesting whether the arms are there or whether they're not, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, but we'll come back to that. And as you said, Laura Mays is here, which is amazing. And she's, well, she's not here. She's in California in Fort Bragg, where she lives. And um, it's, it's good morning. Good morning, Laura. It's 7, um, 7.39, 20 to 8 in the morning for Laura. So thank you so much for joining us. And so Laura is a woodworker. She's a designer and an educator. And she um, is she was working in Letter Frack just down the road from us here in County Mayo. But now she's in the Cranov School in, um, and she's the director of fine woodworking there. Um, would you like to... Is that um, the name of the school, Laura? And please take yes. the take the take your um, your talk away now. Thanks so much for joining us at this early hour. Oh well, it's a pleasure. Um, I feel very honoured to have been invited. Um, I remember when I I started learning woodworking in 1995 or thereabouts in Letterfrag. I absolutely poured over Claudia's book on Irish vernacular furniture and I studied every page and every image. So it's an honor to be in her virtual presence and all of yours. And so thank you for inviting me. Um, as you said, I, I'm not a scholar or a researcher. Um, I'm a woodworker and a designer and an educator. And I think my role here is to be looking to the future and thinking about how the past influences how we go forward. So I'm going to talk about a series of work I did based on the Sligo chair and also look more generally at how the past plays into the future. I mean, clearly we don't have a today and a tomorrow without a yesterday. Um, they are inextricably linked. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Ireland in Dublin and trained as an architect in UCD in the late 80s and 90s. And then I studied woodworking in Letterfrack for what I thought was a, a kind of a break from architecture, but I fell head over heels for woodworking at that point, and, and I've never gone back to architecture. Um, now I'm a woodworker and a teacher at a small woodworking school, as you said, it was called the Cranoff School, named after James Cranoff um, in Northern California. So greetings from another West Coast and another ocean. As a teacher, I interact daily uh, on a daily basis with people starting on their woodworking journey. And I hope I can provide some insight into their thoughts and concerns and processes, also into my own as a, as a designer. This is me attempting to teach dovetails like at a distance, socially distance. So I'll start with, um, with my story, uh, my interaction with this LIGO chair. I was doing a master's thesis around 2006, I think it was, in NCAD. Um, though I was doing it by distance as I continued to teach at Letterfrack. Anyway, I was having a hard time getting a uh, focus on what I wanted to do. And one of the features of being a woodworker 
at least in my experience, is that you get to spend a, a lot of time at the bench doing fairly repetitive tasks, leaving the mind free to wander. And where mine often wandered too, was wondering about what it was that I was actually doing, what meaning it had in the world and how other people saw it. What did it mean to be making something in this undeniably slow and inefficient craft manner in a contemporary context? What was the value, if any, of what I was doing? I, I knew I wanted the thesis to revolve around these questions, and you can see nine more of them, nine of the questions there, but I didn't know how to structure it at all. And I stumbled upon, like many before me, the notion of using chairs as bearers of meaning, or in my case, of questions. So I called them my vehicles of inquiry. And I came up with this chart um, of how I thought chairs could address the different questions. Um, and one of the issues I felt it was, I felt was important to craft was its relation to location, to being um, grounded in a specific place. How, how it is responding to the local conditions of material availability, and needs and wants and so on, and how global capitalism tries to gloss over these <clears throat> specificities in an attempt to make everything available all the time, everywhere. So as I was living in Connemara at the time, it made sense to think of something specifically Irish and even west of Ireland. And so, you know, I like the Sligo chair. I saw it in the National Museum, in fact. And, but maybe I was drawn to it simply by the fact of its name. I mean, I wasn't that far away from Sligo at the time living just on the Galway side of the Galway Mayo border in North Connemara. But I do think it was more than that. Um, it has a singularity of form, as, as Claudia was discussing earlier, um, that makes it stand out. I mean, it's somewhat unusual. It's, I, I never thought of it as a kind of like an everyday chair, um, while it's still being within the vernacular tradition. And I guess it's triangular nature, which you discuss, and it's three-leggedness also made it seem interesting from a kind of formal point of view. And by formal, I mean relating to its form, to its um, set of shapes and parts. And what I tried to do, oh, I, I, I drew it quite a lot just to start to understand it. One of the things I tried to do was to unpack the form as much as possible. And in a way, this is a version of what Claudia was describing, trying to kind of understand it from construction points of view. And, um, but I guess my purpose was different. Um, I, I was trying to analyze it and distill it down to what I thought were the component parts of the Sligo chair um, and how it was joined together, um, what was sticks and what was slabs, you know, parts that are basically square and cross section versus parts that are basically that are rectangular and their relation to each other. Um, at the time, I called this analysis uh, a pattern. Um, I could have used the word archetype or precedent, perhaps. But I was using the word pattern um, based on the model of um, this book by Christopher Alexander um, and his a pattern language, which I was very interested in at that time, which I still am. Um, and ooh, I thought I could morph these parts, uh, push them and pull them and skew them while still retaining the original pattern. And I guess I was trying to take a traditional form and see if I could make modern forms from that. So there, there's the first one that I made. And I think it has a kind of a stately appearance without having a high back. I think of it as having a kind of a mid-century modern kind of Scandinavian look and by association, kind of an associ uh, association with social democracy, rather than what I thought of as the more domineering lines of the original with its, with its tall back. But I was trying to keep the original Sligo pattern in terms of the uh, triangular seat and how the legs are wedged up into the seat and the back is a single element of uh, let's see, rectangular cross section. Um, though in fact, I cut it and rejoined it in order to get the change of angle. And I use quite traditional joinery. As I said, I used um, wedged through tenons, not the tusk tenon going all the way through, but they were wedged through tenons for the front legs. Um, oh, I know that the tusk tenon was coming in on the back, but. Um, and large dovetails at the joint where the armrest joined the back rail, which was uh, there. Uh, interesting, I hadn't realized that that was the point of weakness for the chair. Um, um, this one is made from Irish oak, and it was important for me to use Irish woods. As I said before, that was part of the kind of rationale of, of this project. 
This this wood is from Liz, Liz Nevada in County Carlo. Um, this is the second um, set, second one in the in this Sligo series, although it's kind of actually two chairs that come together to form a single Sligo. So each is like a kind of half of a Sligo chair. Um, and if the previous one was pointing to a kind of somewhat mid-century modern vibe, this one is pointing more to kind of early modernism on the one hand and minimalism on the other. So, for example, uh, Gerrit Rietveld's Berlin chair from and the this you know, part, part of the De Stiel movement from the early part of the 20th century and um, his uh, abstraction of the chair to a series of planes and to Donald Judd for, and other minimalists on the right in the second half of the 20th century. And that was quite deliberate to um, point outside of itself um, at other genres and typologies, uh, particularly those in the design world and the art world. Um, this one is made from Irish walnut, um, I kind of like the way the wildness of the grain works against the severity of the straight lines. And this walnut came from kiln dried hardwoods in County Wicklow. The third one is this, uh, is made from a cherry tree, from Irish cherry, that I had actually known the tree in its tree form as a child. It was in the garden of friends of my parents and I had swung on a swing from its branches um, and they had had it cut, cut and planked up and I used some of the wood and it makes this very lightweight side or dining chair. I, you know, definitely departing further from the Sligo pattern, pushing its three-leggedness, trying to gain more stability. And also in the backrest, it's um, significantly different, but still using kind of exposed joinery and a, a nod to tradition. And the fourth one um, was this attempt to bring the chair, if not exactly to production, at least to repeatable uh, in a very small scale batch production. Um, this one is quite far, I acknowledge, from the Sligo original at this point, but I, I had got there in a series of steps, a kind of a continuum. This is um, ash veneer from England. They're pre-cut veneers of about two millimeters, I think maybe a little bit less, ca capable of taking the bends quite easily. There's another couple of shots of that. Um, I, I kind of uh, rationalized the um, the two back legs by saying the negative space in between was like the third leg, but uh, I think that is possibly um, post-rationalization. Anyway, I, I made a number of these um, because once I had the forms, I could, uh, they were not, it's not exactly easy. They were repeatable. I made some in plywood as well, like this painted one. You can see the uh, front legs are different. They're no longer kind of sticks jammed up from underneath into the seat. They're a separate U-shaped component. And with the color ones, like this two color one, um, I was interested in differentiating inside from outside, kind of, uh, kind of akin to the uh, negative space, I guess. And I, I I think that one of the things I liked about the original Sligo chair is the um, interesting negative spaces that it has, like the holes in the seat. So the next set of chairs I made were based on what I considered the exact opposite of the Sligo chair. That was my intention, was to find something that I considered the opposite. And I took that to mean a mass-produced chair and a chair from a huge retailer, um, Ikea. This, this, that was the Stefan chair which at that time was the cheapest chair that Ikea sold. Um, and the first I made in that series was um, this exact replica um, made in pear wood, um, which is you know a very fine cabinet maker's hardwood. Um, it's from Austria or Germany. I, I got it through a wood supplier in England and they didn't know exactly where it was from, but that part of the world. And I had this left over from another project. Um, so, and I suppose this exercise is trying to examine how much the material and the means of production are important to the meaning of an object. You know, given that I was making it in exactly the opposite manner, as it were, but the form remains identical. And instead of putting it together with uh, typical IKEA knockdown fittings, I used traditional joinery, like these through tenons. And um, I tried to keep the size of parts, like even those tenons, similar to the um, heads of the bolts in the original. 
Um, people ask me what the kind of results of this exercise were, uh, like, were there differences? And as I asked different people, I've got different answers. Some people found that the material fundamentally did change the chair for them and others found that the form kind of overrode that. So I guess that's what's known as inconclusive. Um, the second Sligo nemesis was this one where I smashed up a, a Stefan chair, as me smashing it, and put it back together again as carefully as possible. Um, this was my attempt to look at the importance of repa repair and mending in craft. Um, that is not always about making something new in the world, but getting something back to a functional and desirable state. And the smashing up, fun as it was, was really just a way to expedite the process of getting the chair to a point of needing repair. Smashing wasn't really the point. Um, and there you can see a detail. It was, it was like a puzzle, putting it back together. And I did it over several months. I just kept all the parts on a big table and every now and then I'd go and fit another piece in. The third one in this series is this rocker, which I made by kind of mashing two Stefan chairs together. And you can see a diagram. I used the back legs from one of the rockers, uh, from one of the chairs as the rockers and the front legs as the armrests and inserted a portion in the middle to make the chair wider. Because uh, as you just pointed out, having arms on a chair can sometimes kind of impede its use. So you need to make it wider, to get yourself in there. Um, and this one is about um, intervening in mass production, um, how one can have agency in that and can in fact change it. One can use a mass produced object as raw material rather than as an end point in itself. And this is the last one of the, um, the Sligo nemesis, the, um, and it's the outline of a Sligo, of a Stefan chair, sorry, blending to the profile of a body in the middle. Um, and it's my commentary, or at least pointing to the relationship of chairs and the body. Uh, it's probably easier to see from the set of drawings, which were the files that were sent to the laser cutter to cut the cardboard. Um, I mean, obviously, it's the primary purpose of chairs to support the body in space, um, as well as there being an analogy with a body in that uh, chairs have arms and legs and backs and all these body parts. So it's both like a person and supports a person at the same time. So those were my um, forays into the Sligo chair and its nemesis and my attempt to use them as, as vehicles of inquiry. And soon after that series, I moved to America and I also moved into a long and less structured series of high back chairs or wing chairs or porters chairs as they're all called. I mean, these chairs, one of the things I was looking at is how these chairs are space creators. One normally thinks of a chair as something that stands in space, but these provide more enclosure and thus actually create a little space kind of within them. I didn't explore them as rigorously as the Sligo chair, as I had with the Sligo chair, but I, my experience with the Sligo chair had given me a basis on which I felt I could study and use archetypes from the past, albeit in this looser way. That was the first one. Um, this, is the, this one is made from a drone, which is a tree that grows around here actually further north from here, it grows better up into Oregon and Washington state. Uh, I, there's a relative of it in Ireland, the um, arbutus or strawberry tree, but that is a shrub. And here it grows into a huge tree, which has this beautiful wood, which is not really commercially available because uh, all the commercial trees around here are softwoods and the hardwoods are considered something of a, a nuisance. And the drone is hard to dry and it warps and twists in the drying process and it requires someone who really knows what they're doing, but it is this lovely fine, fine grained wood, uh, varying in color from a light pink through orangey to sometimes a really rich dark red. I made another one uh, from a different piece of madrone. You can see it's, it's more, more red. And incidentally, this one has an interesting story. Um, this one was at a gallery for sale in San Francisco and somehow, well, I mean, I say somehow, but really I know exactly how, the gallery destroyed it by leaving it out in a rainstorm overnight and it started to come apart. Uh, I claimed on insurance and got some money for it, but it was kind of heartbreaking. I had put literally hundreds of hours into the into making this. Um, it's a difficult chair to, to bring around those curves, to cooper it around the curves. 
Anyway, apparently it was out in a dumpster and a guy walked past and he was like, hmm, I wonder what that is. And he pulled out the parts. He then moved away from San Francisco up to Washington State and he brought the parts with him. And he and a friend put the parts together over a few months and remade the chair. There it is in his house. He found me over the internet and told me he'd done this. Um, and I love this story of love and care and attention. It kind of, to me, it's the epitome of craft. What, what I did with the Stefan chair by smashing it up quickly, this happened more slowly and more kind of <laughs> realistically and with more than myself in the cast of characters. And he now has this chair sitting in the house in his house. And I find it a heartwarming story of the care and attention that has been lavished twice onto this chair. Here's another one. Um, it's called Ample. It's, I was trying to make something kind of cozier and rounder and uh, upholstered. It's made from American ash, which is sadly being decimated by the em emerald ash borer beetle. Um, ash is very cheap right now because they are cutting down the trees in advance of the beetle getting there. But in a decade or so, there probably won't be any ash trees around. It will go the same way as elms and chestnuts, which were apparently um, very, very widespread up the east coast of America. This one's called Unflappable. It's made of claro walnut. Um, walnuts are a huge uh, food crop around here. And it does result in there being a lot of walnut wood around. Um, this one is, uh, I didn't make myself, I designed it, but it was made by a company in Wisconsin. And I suppose uh, one of the things I find most interesting in chairs in general is that they have this dual aspect of being the most three-dimensional of furniture forms, as, where, as well as arguably the most culturally loaded. Um, in terms of its three-dimensionality, you know, if a cabinet, for example, usually stands against a wall and one is seeing less of it in its three-dimensional shape. And chairs, certainly as we use them now, tend to be in the middle of rooms or around a table. So we see them from a multitude of angles and they become more like sculptural objects. And they're loaded with all this meaning about the body and comfort and ideas of what a home is. And so I think they remain perennially fascinating and open for, for exploration. So I guess that's my look at a look at my relationship with Sligo chairs as a designer and a woodworker and a maker. And as I as I list out these words, I think that each of them brings something different to the conversation because they have different nuances of meaning. For example, the word maker, certainly over here in the USA. I'm not as sure about Ireland nowadays, having left a, a decade ago. Um, the word maker has connotations of someone involved with um, technology, uh, often with kind of hacking things, getting things to do things they weren't intended to do. It's kind of part of that Silicon Valley mentality of break things and, and move fast, which is in many ways is completely at odds with the uh, word woodworker, which has overtones of a craftsperson, someone who has an eye on tradition as well as looking forward, and someone who is more likely to move slowly and to fix things, um, someone who pays attention and wants to make things well. But that that all sounds very attractive, it also runs the risk of being kind of conservative and maybe not responding to the concerns and pressures of the contemporary world. So for myself, I want to be someone who looks backwards and makes with care and attention and draws on the lessons of the past, but is also looking forwards. But frankly, to some extent, I'm not overly concerned about what is made and why. I'm more interested in who is making and with what material. I think those are the most interesting pressing issues in craft right now and for such a long time the identity of the maker was uh, considered an irrelevance and you know to some extent it is but look what happens when the identity isn't considered lo and behold woodworkers are overwhelmingly um, male and here in the united states white as well so although identity could be considered in theory, at least an irrelevance in practice, it clearly isn't. And the lack of diversity starts to seem like the natural order of things, like that women either aren't interested or aren't capable of being woodworkers, neither of which, uh, I'm sorry, both of which are far, far from the truth. And so opening up the woodshop to a wider group of people is, is both important and interesting to me as a group of students um, at the Cranoff School. Um, 
in 2019, I, I co-curated with a, with a friend of mine, Deirdre Visser, uh, a show of women woodworkers, because of course there are some, even if women are numerically underrepresented. We had a show of, um, we collected the work together of 44 women identified woodworkers at the Center for Art and Wood in Philadelphia. And it was a, a well-received show, really showcased the diversity and depth of work that women are doing in the US today. We showed work uh, from women in their 70s who had been the first to be able to legally demand equal access to the woodshop in educational settings under what's called here Title IX, right up to women just beginning their careers. And from those involved in quite sculptural work to those more interested in the boundaries of craft and design and craft and production. Uh, here's two more sculptural pieces, one on the left by Vivian Chu, so it's kind of blank, well, it's called blankets, made from little cubes of poplar. And this one on the right by Yuri Kobayashi, it's a big, it's about six and a half feet tall or thereabouts. Um, it's kind of wheel-like affair. Um, top left, a, a piece, um, Katie Hudnall, who's been making from recycled materials kind of all through her career. Um, Christine Lee at the bottom right there using um, shims from construction uh, in this very uh, kind of, um, it almost feels geological fashion. So the, the art world, the people who are interested in the boundaries of art and design and production. And um, anyway, after the show, uh, we began work on a book on the same topic and we interviewed a, a lot of women woodworkers for it. We also started to try and uncover a history of women in woodworking, which at first we assumed would be a very, very short chapter. But we kept uncovering women who had been working with wood back into the Middle Ages and, and further back. Unfortunately, when the um, pandemic hit, I had to withdraw as a, as a co-author. I just couldn't handle um, homeschooling and, with my daughter and keep up my job. And so Deirdre has brought it to completion and its publication date is next month. Um, published by Rutledge, so something to look forward to. My second chief concern of nowadays is so um, huge and overwhelming that I almost feel silly talking about it. I mean, of course, the environmental crisis that is not just pending, but has already started. Uh, because, of course, our future on this planet doesn't depend on woodworkers, but it does depend on all of us changing our relationship with the natural world and with all the stuff we derive from it, in other words, everything. Um, everything we have, all our stuff and our houses and what we put in them and how we build them and how we inhabit them and how we move between them and the materials that we use and where we get them and what happens to them when the object reaches the end of its useful life or when it falls out of fashion. And I know that woodworkers, insofar as there is a unified body of woodworkers, which there isn't, are a minuscule and negligible percentage of the users of trees on the planet. Um, construction uses far, far more and is massively wasteful. On the other hand, they, or I should say we, probably have a higher symbolic value uh, and therefore perhaps a bigger influence than our numbers would suggest. Anyway, I identify as a woodworker, so I have to work from where I'm at and think about my role in the world and how to play my part in play, being a steward of the resources that the planet has offered to us. And so it's for that reason that I pay, pay a great deal of attention to where my material comes from. Wood, even more than other materials, is not fungible. One piece is not the same as another in terms of its colour and grain and properties like strength and flexibility and stiffness or brittleness, even of the same species. It depends on the specificities of where it grew and the climate, even the microclimate, um, and how it was harvested and dried and stored. And I think it's our responsibility to be as alert as possible to these particularities and working with them and drawing them out. Um, I think I, beyond that, I think that reusing wood as much as possible is important and is going to become increasingly important as we start to think about trees as having value when they're alive and not just when they're harvested. Living here in Northern California, I realize that the destruction of the redwood forests over the course of uh, 150 years down to about 5% of what it was in the 1850s. It's just vast. I, I say 5% five, 5 of the old growth trees are still remaining. Obviously, new trees have grown since. Um, the environmental destruction was huge. Um, I guess it's what happened in Europe thousands of years ago, but its relative recentness makes it that much more kind of visceral and poignant here. The old 
growth trees were mind boggling in their size up to 30 feet in diameter and 400 feet high and built the cities up and down the west coast of the of the usa redwoods is um, a phenomenal wood in its properties with an amazing strength to weight ratio for example the wood industry oh there's a picture of a tree being taken out by um by train um just north of here um the timber industry remains absolutely vast as the Italian designers former Fantasma put it. It is tentacular, almost too big to see. It also remains to a large extent unregulated. Um, though we often re and we often reframe that as illegal nowadays, though it's unclear about who's legal we are talking about. Um, former Fantasma put together an exhibition, a cambio and a, a catalogue about the wood industry. It's really uh, fantastic. Um, right now in a forest only about five miles away from here where I live, there's a struggle going on uh, about um, what's called Jackson State Demonstration Forest with, that is owned by the state of California and is supposed to demonstrate the best of forestry practices to the timber industry. But the local people are saying that the practices are in themselves archaic and only value trees as lumber, whereas we should be valuing the forest as an amenity, as a carbon sink. And so it's the current argument right here on the ground, right in front of me. It's a second growth forest, meaning that the trees are around 100 years old at this point, starting to reach the size where they are valuable as lumber. And here most houses are constructed from wood and there is a housing shortage. So there is a conflict of interests and it's interesting to watch it play out. Um, thinking about reuse and recycling and, and all that, um, on the left is an old door made from old growth redwood and on the right is a table I made from it. I think I was um, deliberately going for a very non-traditional form. It's the same impetus that was behind the Sligo chair series, which is to take something old, um, in that case the kind of old pattern, in this case the old wood, and make something from it. But the thing that, that you make doesn't have to be archaic or refer in many ways back to its origins. I mean, I didn't want this table to look recycled particularly, um, not that I was hiding it either. You can see the nail holes in the wood, but the shape is definitely kind of crisp and I hope contemporary. There's a picture of my cat sitting on it. Um, so to start to wind things up, um, Ultimately, it behooves us all to become more conscious of the web of connections uh, to the world around and our mutual interdependence. Um, insofar as my thesis uh, had quote unquote results to its inquiry, um, it was decidedly not a scientific inquiry with quantifiable results. It was that craft is about connections in all kinds of ways from the literal to the metaphorical. So from actually joining things together to connecting backwards through time to through historical objects, um, a, a psychological resonance, um, kind of person to person, even if separated by decades or even centuries. Um, seeing how someone else has done something as a woodworker, it's uh, the connection of, of, of to another woodworker centuries before. Um, I think this is an incredibly exciting time to be a woodworker and a designer. Um, I think that there's a lot of potential to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. I think that by increasing diversity, by bringing new people into the quest questions, I think that we will come up with new and better answers. I think that the more we can analyze the past to think of ways of doing things in the future is really important. I mean, we've had 100, 150 years of rampant exploitation of use of all the carbon and solar energy that have been captured and buried in the ground um, as fossil fuel and we just kind of blasted our way through that but before that we had ways of doing things and we just we need to explore ways of doing them again um, i don't mean to be pollyannish and suggest that there aren't massive challenges and that it will be there will be difficult choices to make and changes to the way we live there are irreversible things happening, things that we have no control to halt at this point. But um, despite the sadness and the tragedy of what's going on, I think there's also a lot of potential and hope. And so I'll leave you with that. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Thanks so much, Laura. That was wonderful. My God, the sun is really coming yes, up. Yes, sorry, I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't see myself. I see I'm being whited out there. Yeah, yeah, it's yes. waning here, but it's certainly it's it's glorious over there. Um, I actually I've only been to San Francisco once, but I remember going to the Clift Hotel, and it's the Redwood Room, and it was like a real 1930s um um Art Deco Hotel, but it was just beautiful and. Really, I'd never realized just the size of the redwoods. They were just incredible. It's just, I think it's hard for anyone. You know, it's like a, it's like a storybook when you're a child. It's these are giant things. They really, they were really giant. are. When you go into yeah. like a, a grove of them, it's like going into a cathedral or something. They just yeah. soar so high above you. It's really, I know. And when you said Pollyanna, I was thinking of Tumbelina then, <laughs> you know, it's almost like, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I just wanted to give a call out for questions and um, hopefully if people want to put some questions into the chat, um, but I thought as well, your exhibition with Deirdre Vizars was wonderful. It looks, it's really great. And, um, and that idea with the Folklife Collection of the museum here, it's always about provenance. We don't just want a chair from an antique shop. We want, it, we want to know who and where it was used and who made it and who sat on it and who was breastfed on it or, you know, whatever. I was thinking of the nursing chairs there from the Scottish um, talk earlier. But, um, but that idea of who and what and and why and provenance and but I love the fact that um it's so important to understand where the wood is from and um and it's almost that other life it's not just the people it's the life of the wood and where it was where it was grown where it's lifetime so it's it's almost that personable connection to the wood and there was one other thing that reminds me of um work I've done on the hearth furniture collection those human characteristics that come into the chair. So you've got your back, your legs, your arms, your feet. And um, I find that that comes in to some other objects associated with folk tradition. And I think it's because folk objects literally have the word folk in them and they're, the person is involved in, the, in it. And when I think of even something like the three-legged pot that we kind of think of like the witch just cauldron type of pot, you know, um, three legs for the support. So they'd call it three legs, but it had two ears on the either on the um, on the top to support a kind of um, these pot hangers. But it also had the belly then. And that's where we get that pot belly. So it's almost these human characteristics often come into that folk objects. And when something's as important to where you sit and what you eat, I think that's where you get those connections to the, the body itself, you know. Um, yeah, so there's some questions coming in and and um, yeah, and I loved when you smashed up the Stefan chair and it sounded very like jigsaw therapy that so many people in COVID lockdown did, you know, or maybe it wasn't such therapy at that time, you know, when if you're homeschooling, there's no therapy there. <laughs> Yeah. So um, Claudia has a question for Laura. Do you want to ask it yourself, Claudia, or can we can technology allow that to, for us all to be here? Yeah, great. If you can hear me. Oh, Laura, that was such an inspiring talk. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. So many different things coming up there. And of course, I was familiar with some of your earlier iterations before you moved to California. Um, and I approve wholeheartedly of your smashing up of that chair from that particular <laughs> company which we won't discuss any further um coming back to a passion that i have which is about you know the circular economy and sustainability and you know i think we can learn a lot from irish vernacular furniture from their frugality and their fact you know the fact they didn't just go out and buy new wood they they reused a ladder and turned it into something else or they reused a cartwheel and made it into a ladder and cradle and when you're making your furniture obviously you're you're picking up, I like the door that you made into a, a table so elegantly. Um, do, you, do you think about future restorability of the pieces that you're making at all? Do you, do you ever wonder how it's going to be mended if it falls off the back of a lorry and needs to be fixed? Or um, how does that come into your consciousness when you're designing? Um, well, I'm embarrassed to say that it kind of doesn't that much. I, I think a lot about using hide glue, but then I never actually do. 
Mm. Um, I think because I was educated <laughs> in the use of, you know, basically PVA, um, white glue, um, mm. I, I revert to that at the moment of, um, of putting things together because it's, I, I'm, it's what I know, but, I, um, yes, I should think about it more. It is the logical next step, obviously. Um, I mean, the, I, the guy I, I who um, it, found really. the bits of the chair in a dumpster, um, mm. that had been glued together with, uh, with white glue, with ordinary oh. kind of hard work glue. And he, he was able to put it back together again. Um, I noticed that the chair got a bit narrower. <laughs> so I guess he planed every joint and put it in, in the putting back together. Um, mm. But no, uh, it is a really good point it, to continue the circle of um, use and reuse mm. of material to think mm. about. I do sometimes think about slab tables, you know, the fashion for these ginormous slab tables, but it's a great way to keep wood for the future. I don't particularly care for them aesthetically. Um, you know, these huge just kind of lumps of wood on, on, on legs um, being used mm. as conference tables and things. And I think, oh, yes, well, they're just keeping it there for someone to make something a little more elegant mm. in the future. Yes. Um, Laura, did, yes, yeah, so you've, um, I thought it was, um, I thought that there was so many wonderful parts to your talk and the, but the making of the, your students, how many have them got, have, how many of them have gone on now to make other items and how are they all out on their own? Are they all surviving well? <laughs> well, making a living as a woodworker is a hard hard thing to do um, and we get students from a really wide variety of backgrounds coming to the school from people who've been carpenters and want to do finer work and we have people from the big tech companies who are sick of working with kind of um, pixels and things and want to work with their hands for a bit um, and they continue on they they come to the school from these from the wide variety of backgrounds and they, they tend to go off into a wide variety of um, background uh, futures as well um some form their own companies uh or workshops which as i say is a hard hard road but um they they do um some um the, it tends to be that the ones from the tech companies can't resist the big salaries they do tend to go back to the to apple and google and facebook and all that um quite a lot become teachers um, some have work in museums and, and, and in restoration. I mean, it's really a, a wide variety. I would, I did a survey of students a few years back and it seemed to me that everybody who wanted to be working with wood was continuing to work in wood one way or another. It wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily a clear career path. It was okay. it's just people trying to fit it into their lives, whether that's, um, as their money making, um, uh, part of their life or, or or on the side as it were yeah there's some students actually in putting some um items or some past students putting um some uh, questions in the text there's edward dunn and he said he studied in letter frack in the early 2000s and he's now living in latvia as a furniture maker timber frame designer and teaching traditional hand tool woodworking with the north northmen guild and she'd, he'd like to ask Laura her opinion on the experience with timber frame design in the US. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any whatsoever. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a, at, a, at a scale that I don't, I don't uh, participate. I don't work in things that big. I mean, I'm interested in it, and um, uh, but I, I don't know very much about it. I would be fooling you all if I said I didn't know much. No, I think it's great that um, that Edward had gone on from Letter Frack and is now living in Latvia. And we've so many Latvians over here um, doing something similar. But there's another D Sinnet. Um, she was growing up as a skip diver and reworker. And I've seen more of my friends beginning to do the same as they age. How do you think we could start an appropriate conversation with con con county... county with county and municipal refuse companies in order to catch the broken resources before it gets dumped. Wow. I mean, that sounds like a kind of a political question. I mean, in a way, yeah. a, a logistical question. It, it's obviously the sort of, you know, landfill is just so like, you know, disgusting, really. Mm -hmm. 
ways to break break that cycle are obviously really important but how one does i mean i guess this is what it really points to is that it's 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 in the detail in the, it's in the doing that that it all matters um so um pushing on doors asking questions um just trying from wherever you are at i mean that's all I, that's what i do i think I, i'm like what can i do from yeah. where i'm at i'm a teacher i'm a woodworker what can i what can i do i can just um yeah. do what i can you know you know and it's amazing our objects um from that are on display here you know um when you think of these like buzzwords of sustainability almost when actually people just lived sustainable lives their, their lives and everything they did was sustainable um and um you know that because things were made from locally resourced material there was no there was no carbon footprint you know it was just everything was there um there's a paul murphy has a question about the faceted detail in some of your designs and can you speak a little on inspiration and execution um yeah uh, i guess there's uh, different ways of answering that question um i, I remember seeing it's in a, a film um and it's a question to the um, Japanese designer. I'm going to mess up his name, uh, Naoto Fukasawa, I think it is. And uh, he talked about peeling potatoes when he was a child and how um, you went from this round object to this faceted object um, in in peeling the potato and uh, how um, how nice it felt. <laughs> you know, obviously the rounded object is nice too, but just the faceting, how good it felt to the hand. So part of it is about just like making kind of hand appeal the um change of change of um surface of plane um another is that i really really like using planes hand planes um to make things and they kind of um in a way automatically make uh facets um I try to avoid using sandpaper i mean i do but i avoid it as much as i can so um when you plane wood, you are cutting the fibers, you're severing them so they come out cleaner. It's like I, I sometimes draw the analogy if you tried to, uh, the difference between cutting your hair with scissors or like abrading your hair with sandpaper, which which is going to give the better kind of cut. Um, so severing the fibers give, makes a cleaner cut. And um, so I like using hand planes, make, make the wood responds well, or some woods respond really well to that. And so they, the kind of facets are, are natural or a, an automatic um, result of that. Um, yeah, and I think that what Justice. we can do is like, bring out lines, if, as it were, like you can kind of like uh, accentuate certain lines, um, in certain, um, use them as kind of an, uh, you know, if you want something to to look longer and skinnier, you can you can use a facet to kind of increase that that um, appearance. Yeah, I was just going to ask you another question, Nora, because I mean, I think that a lot of our chairs are very similar, but you know, in terms of size and there and when you put your made your um your chair larger and the the idea how much in terms of the weight bearing nowadays is considered when people are so many there's so many different sizes of us out there you know and you know i think of the the in claudia's work she's done so much on the settle beds but you know they're really high backed and really high and you, a child would sit in them and their legs would dangle you know and even an adult would as well you know they're so high they're not really they're not really comfortable either and um and yet then i think of the sizes of the the people nowadays and our weights and our differing weights all the time especially after covid and um, the the idea that you need to kind of address that in design do you really think about the person who sits in the chair that you're making or is it really design you're thinking uh well chair design is so interesting because yeah, it's a kind of like, do you think of it in terms of like a pair of jeans? Um, you know, one person's jeans isn't going to fit another. Like how much are you custom fitting it and how much are you uh, going for an average and how much are you trying to accommodate the kind of like the uh, both ends of the spectrum? Um, 
I think, well, the, you know, all the chairs we use in our kind of uh, our ta task chairs or ergonomic chairs, which are not the kind of chairs that I make, um, you know, office chairs, essentially, have to deal with that far more than I do. I guess I'm dealing much more with a kind of um, aesthetics and the kind of ideas end of the spectrum yes. rather than the specifics. I try to make them, you know, I try to get various people to sit in them and see how comfortable they are. Um, there's, and also, you know, hopefully like not fall down. Um, there is a really interesting book called The Chair by a woman called Galen Krantz. Um, one of the things she discusses is even this idea of comfort and how uh, culturally kind of um, imposed it is that a lot of what we consider comfort is in fact expectation. Yeah. Um, what kind of told what's comfortable and then we expect that to be um, what chairs feel like to sit in and in fact it's not uh, necessarily that physiologically good for for us like comfortable chairs uh, aren't um, necessarily that good for the body in fact sitting in general is a fairly um, toxic thing to be doing um, you know I, I'm sure that phrase sitting is the new smoking is appeared on people's radars um so it it does it is a huge it's not easy to answer that question yeah. uh, for myself i just try to work within i suppose the you know call it the extremes of this of the ends of the spectrum i guess yeah no that's funny um the the there's a question here actually and we i'm just going to see if um tech Technology allows us to all be up on the screen, all the speakers, that would be wonderful. And to invite people back because there's, and maybe that you can see your own questions or questions coming up for you. Um, Barbara, just uh, there was a question um, from Jeremy Rycroft about the slide the chair appears to more look more like an agricultural implement and that structure. And I just wondered when you look of our museum collection, can you see that coming through in any of the the objects uh well i think it has a lot to do with the you know the, the fact that they're vernacular makers and you know they're using the materials they have um but of course i'd defer to claudia on that question because claudia of course is the woodworker uh so she would know more about that than me thanks um well i suppose you know some of the some of the features we're finding on the sligo chair definitely we would find for example on on carts so the, the bottom of the back board leg is often chamfered and that's something which is clearly a wheelwright's reflexive response to making something way less and decorating it at the same time and we find it on flat carts and wagons and things made by wheelwrights um you know the other reveal construction is is certainly something that people making tools and frames and harrows and all the other wooden implements with which they're farming yes this is the same kind of thing i mean it's interesting that dirk and i think you were saying barbara he's he's um a cooper and a carpenter at no point is he listed as a chair maker actually because chair makers are a, a separate specialism um so you know i think he's bringing his carpentry skills into that very heavy example of the sligo chair and I, yes i do think you know some of the sligo chair features are you know pretty functional and heavy and could function in the same way as tools i suppose yes i agree yeah and i'd like to add something to claudia's yes. answer if that's all right yes please yeah. um just as a an observation about um the link between um implements and uh furniture um in scotland there is also certainly that that um that that link um tools for instance the spoke shave used by the wheelwright that claudia mentioned is appears in in shape in in components of furniture and i just it's very speculative but i think the sligo chair the the um the angled um components of the seat remind me of a hay of a hay fork you know a large hay fork with those mm -hmm. strengthening brackets yeah and um yeah, yeah. in scotland certainly the um furniture relates to the different kind of farming in different areas in, in the west the pastoral area where um, dairy farming and cattle uh, are mainly um, uh, farmed. Uh, furniture seems to relate to that kind of farming. And in the east, where it's arable, um, furniture is very different. So I would suggest that you know hay forks are something which must be used a lot in, in, in the west of in Ireland. 
in Galway. Mm -hmm. I don't know Definitely. whether that's a link or not. I think so. I think it answers the our our questioner. And and when I think of, I was just thinking of the loy uh, in terms of the spade and the loy. But the loy has that that curve underneath, um, and it is almost it's the way of, it's like a. It, um, it's like a plow, really, and you're using mm -hmm. a loy, but that curve is what um, brings up the, the um, it, it turns the sod and turns the soil. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely, I suppose it's everyone's working with what's available locally, as yeah. we said before. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Jean Feuerberg has a, an, um, a question in there in the chat for you, Claudia. Can you see that? Jean was part of the exhibition here at the museum, our Irish chair. He was one of the partners with Rosa. Um, so. um, no, unfortunately, I can't see his question. I can't see anybody's questions, but maybe, Claudia, you can well, I'll read, I'll read them out. Yeah. Yeah. So it says, uh, Jean says, Claudia, very insightful summary of the history of the Sligo team chair. You traced a top-down lineage um, descendant from aristocratic types mm. or precedents. Would you consider a bottom-up evolution based on local types and vernacular craft skills, say taking a three-legged milking stool as a starting point? Um, that's an interesting question. I think actually no, I wouldn't, because when I look at the whole of Ireland, which I do with vernacular furniture and particularly with chairs, you know, there are there are local chair types which are like local accents in people's voices. You know, they, they don't spread very far necessarily. And the Sligo chair is very, very peculiar to that area. And I don't think it's evolved um, in a bubble at all. Absolutely, I don't know. I mean, I think the three-legged chair has got a completely different structure. It's got a, a thick slab which is quite small with three stake legs added to it um, and no back and, and they usually sticks the legs. I think the Sligo chair has got an extraordinary medieval construction, you know, that might go back further, but then actually we've got medieval construction in the settle bed with, with sledge feet, which are removable. That's a medieval thing. We've got it in trellis tables with that tusk tenon. I, you know, I am actually convinced more, more so even with, you know, there's brilliant talks that we heard this morning from Scotland. I'm, ever more convinced that it comes from France and Scotland and I think if we could do a sort of a, a computer version of, of the different features of the Fife chair for example with the holes in the crest and you know yes. the Cacatoire yes. yes. chair I, I think we, we would end up with the Sligo chair where somebody doesn't want to make a panel he just wants to make a chair that's yes. a stripped down version so he's not going to bother with that panel in the back he's just going to use one board which yes, is actually exactly. quite a bit strong you know not stronger than a panel which is kind of complicated and you know they're not panel makers those chair makers they're you know so i think it's definitely coming from france coming from scotland i i would disagree that it's just part of um an irish idea i you know the idea of our irish chair kind of jars with me i'm afraid i don't think we can claim it as irish and the same thing happened with the settle bed i was very excited when i started doing this research in the late 80s thinking oh we've got this thing called a settle bed you know it's it's an irish design and isn't that great and then i found it in an english inventory so it's not Irish. It came from England, but it was adopted widely. It was suitable for Ireland with small spaces and no bedrooms. You know, and I think the same thing has happened with the Sligo chair. I think it's it's arrived and people have said, oh, we can make this. We can do this. We'll copy this guy next door. You know, people copied each other um, and that's why it took off. I think we should perhaps do what the botanists do and, and make a, a botanical key. You know, when, when a botanist compares plants or tries to... Uh, analyze a plant to put it in a particular genus or something that uh, they make these key of keys of all the all the features in mm. a very scientific way and, uh, yeah. as, furni as furniture historians well, well we're very sluggish we haven't got to that scientific uh, state yet but i think that the i think your sligo chair is much to me much more related to the boarded stool and the three-legged stool um, mm. because it's it, it's basically nine components in its simplest form and they're they're all boards, aren't they? You know, it, it, it's um, to have um, to have boards is the, is one of the easiest ways to to make furniture. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility going on in that in the design as it evolves in the 19th century, which is all that we can see because we're talking about some hypothetical previous stage. Um, mm. But there's you a lot of the problems in adjusting the seat so that it's about the distribution of the weight and so on mm. but you can actually use you can get by with what you have to hand 
Mm. You because you, these are scantlings, they're, 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 they're bits of timber that you can get your hand on, and they don't mm. actually always have to be. Uh, a lot of the ones we see are replicating very faithfully this particular model, but it's fairly obvious from the very earliest ones that they're very, very different. They don't, there's not, you know, the format uses what you have to hand and, mm. and the trick is to, to, to balance up that T part, the seat against the three legs, make sure it, it's, it's, it's not going to fall over and so forth. But it otherwise mm. is making very good use of the materials, which is very flexible. Mm. Uh, and, I, and, and, and returning to the idea of the uh, could you know where could it been inspired from? I do think that the it's better to look at things than people. Uh, so I you know I'm not convinced about the idea of these these migrating Scots, but the notion that you can find you get hand on a you know a, a French chair is movable, and you can you can sail off and, and find one in you know Bordeaux or something and bring it home and. So the, the things are more portable than, you know, I don't, that, that to me is, is more, is a, a hypothesis, of, of a more flexible hypothesis than, than it being, ha you know, somehow people arriving with, with something that, that, that kind oh, of... Yeah. Well, I kind of agree with Laura with this. I think people are very important yeah. in some respects, but uh, the, uh, what we didn't talk about was the influence of the Kakatoa chair and from my point our point of view in America. It's very interesting, I think, that oh, America yeah. that immigrants uh, from wherever, from Scotland certainly, went to America. Mm. And uh, uh, some of the settlers, for instance the settlers in New Jersey from the Aberdeen area, they'd never met English people before. But there were these all these English people also settling there mm. and also a few Germans and people like that. And uh, the Scots thought, uh, oh, goodness me, we better establish our identity here. So they made Kakatoa's chairs that were more Scottish than any Scottish chair had ever been before, covered in thistles, more triangular, you know, <laughs> chip carved and fantastic. And they, it was a kind of attempt to, to say, we're here. And then, of course, over the years, they became gradually Americanized and their Scottish identity just faded away. But it was there. <laughs> In the 17th century in new jersey yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i think that's brilliant david and i i also agree with you david and i don't agree with you stephen on that people <laughs> thing <laughs> example, I, I mean i've talked too much so a very very quick example is you know we have a lot of irish emigrating to america as we know and the, you know the new world canada um australia but when they get to new york the irish who are used to small spaces and press beds, which are little cupboards that open mm. out and then a bed comes down and they take up hardly any floor space. They remade press beds in New York in such great numbers that they became known as Murphy beds. So that's an example mm. of something that wasn't physically taken, but the Irish, when they arrived, they just went on building what they were used to having at mm. home. And when we see the settle bed in St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada, it's because the Irish arrived there and then they built the settle bed again. And it's in, actually, it's in Montreal as well. You know, so I think things migrate in people's minds. And yes, as David suggested, they, you know, they rebuilt something that's familiar. They want to make their new home feel like their old home that they've sadly had to leave. So I think people do rebuild things. And I think that's probably what's happened, you know, with the Kakatoa chair from France, you know, perhaps French settlers arrived in Sligo with the wine and they, married Irish and then they they talked about these chairs and that's where possibly it began we might never find out but I think this is just the beginning of the research can I just can I just get in there um Claudia and um this this Scottish guys I really enjoyed your talk and I love seeing the connection between the cacatoires and the and the Sligo chair especially Charles Rennie McIntosh's version of it I thought that was quite beautiful um but Claudia do you think is is there a, a, a slot in there for the turn chairs you know the three-legged turn chairs that have the column in the back with the triangular seat. Do you think that somehow fits in with the evolution leading to the Sligo chair? Um, well, actually, I don't because I think I think I know which chair you're talking about. It's usually a triangular. You find it in in um, in the Some Netherlands Venus collections and, and things. It's a, it's a turn chair, and there, and there was something called a turner's chair, which is usually triangular with a panel seat set in three turns rods which are all through mortise but they're all round they're all done with the lathe and sometimes they have one one post that's higher than the rest and actually birthing chairs sometimes look like that but i think it's a different construction 
evolution. And I think it's born of wood turning. So I wouldn't agree that it's it feeds into this boarded chair of ours in Sligo and Galway and kind of, I, I think it's a different thing. I mean, there's a coincidence that it has three legs, but no, I, I don't think we can make that connection in terms of furniture history and evolution. No, I wouldn't agree. Yeah. Can, can I just ask something to just to, to Stephen and David? Um, Stephen, I just want to remind you that the amount of Scots that came over in 1609 mm. in the plantation of Ulster um, mm. would, may have brought a chair, um, some mm. of them. And, and then I was just thinking in terms of the chairs that you showed us. And when Claudia talks about the fact that I think all of them had arms in your case, most of the Scottish chairs, um, but I yeah. just want the capitoire. And is there, was there a back support for carrying it like we have in the James Sligo chair to see you carrying with arms, as Claudia had said? Um, so could you just repeat the very last part Yeah, just, uh, just um, Claudia said you never take a chair up and carry it by its arms. And that, oh. as a result, we had this mm -hmm. little yeah. niche, niche on the back. So I just wanted to ask you about that. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't think there's an immediate st structural connection there. I mean, in terms of the, the difficulty for me with the idea of, of the chair migrating in stages mm. is that the evidence points away from the Scots settlers bringing large quantities of, of cacatois style chairs because Scots had other alternative forms of chair, um, both in the 17th century and afterwards. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, the settling takes place in waves anyway. I mean, it's, 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 it's constant from all over the place. Um, so anything is possible, but you look at what is actually, you know, what evidence is there in Ulster now, and it's for slightly, it's for, for a slightly different, you know, for quite a different type of, of chair form, which um, is distributed about, it's quite a lot of sort of, places either side of the Irish Sea, in fact, that don't necessarily collect, connect very well to the eastern seaboard of, of Scotland. So you, it's, it's, it, this is, it, so for one thing, you've got to break up uh, nations into regions and, and try and see who is moving around and, and just how that breaks down. So I'm a little bit uncomfortable. There just isn't enough evidence of, um, well, you know, there's no real evidence for us to make cacatois chairs, whereas there's a great deal of evidence for uh, things there that are different types. Um, but that doesn't, I mean, for me, that doesn't kill off any connection because, as Claudio said, you would have had uh, trading and so forth going on uh, much earlier. Um, there's the, the, you know, the, the reason why that French form was attractive is because it just was something new at a time when chairs were being... Uh, you know, chairs were a novelty virtually anyway for a great many people, and certainly a novelty in the way in they're being used. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the use of a chair within a wealthy household in the 17th century is an, an enormous gap between what happens in 1600 and 1700, you know. Um, so uh, there's a lot of room for a particular kind of, uh, of, of, of what a chair looks like to have an influence on an awful lot of people. And that might have, so we might have had something that establishes itself, which is then copied into the the you know the term format, that, that that Sligo format. But I think that, but equally, just as the just as that basic cacatois morphs an awful lot depending on where it goes, because the Salisbury you know say the Salisbury examples, they are a real blend of two different traditions going on there that have come from different places and have got very different making kind of backgrounds. Um, but the the it, it might be that what we're currently looking at with the Sligo one is, is yeah, there could have been a, a sort of a cacatois uh, making going on in Connell, you know, that is, uh, and then the, the, the Sligo one is, is, kind of, is again a, a further step on from that, which is just taking elements of it. But there's also these elements that go stretch back, the idea that you've got the demountable furniture construction thing going on so that has to go that has to relate to other forms of woodworking prior to what the evidence we have at the moment and i think that that's it's a bit mysterious but it's very fascinating because that has not evolved out of nowhere that uh, use of that plus tenant at the back you know it's this 
Claudia, do you want to say to talk back there or answer back just to Stephen? Who? You. Sorry, did you? <laughs> well, I, I do think I wish that the French would um, produce a really good book about their uh, vernacular furniture. Yeah and their chair history, for example, you know, just as Stephen has done with this amazing article that I've been reading this week, you know, 100 pages on the Scottish chair. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's what we need on the front. I, sh I, should, I should say that, yeah, yeah. Our, our, yeah. Uh, my colleague Agnes Boss of the Louvre has done a bit of work on these, yeah. on their high fashion 16th century uh, chairs, but of course that's, it doesn't end in a vernacular, it doesn't much appear to end in a vernacular but it doesn't need to. It doesn't really need to. I mean, I think what vernacular makers often did, so I'm sorry to interrupt, was they just saw, we know that this happened with costume all over Ireland. They just saw what was fashionable and within weeks, within days, they were copying it and wearing it and they were wearing, you know, all the same things that their, the people they were employed in the big house were wearing. Um, you know, it's the same with the furniture. They, they'd go into the big house. They were the servants in the big house, the, the common people of Ireland. They'd, they'd see the settle bed you know, used in the stables to house the grooms in the Ormond's castles. And then they'd say, OK, we can have this at home. So I think, you know, the Cacatoir chair could have been seen anywhere and then it would have been imitated, but in a stripped iron functional version in a way that was going to be robust enough for the flagstone floor and the earthen floor and, and the rough and tumble of the Irish farmhouse that didn't need a great big complicated chair. There was no heraldry, there's no carving, there's no need for any of that. No. No. But it's yeah, no, good point. Somebody said, hey, listen, we can spin on this. So Yeah, and I say it didn't actually show very often in the slides there, but um, there, are, there are a quantity of, of the Scottish ones, which are very pared down, just plain panels. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I didn't go down that road, but that, that there's, there's enough to show that, that through the 17th century, there was a, uh, yeah, it wasn't purely these very uh, showy examples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was almost a subconscious sort of awareness of it, wasn't it, that when it gets very plain mm -hmm. in the 18th century. Yes, we must ask Agnes Boss about this because she lives in Fife. She, she's a French uh, historian, but she lives in Fife. And she, um, but there is a, also, I think there's a, a series of um, regional guides, rather simple to French furniture for, for each they're, uh, they're pretty old now. Yeah, I they're old. Say. I mean, so this is a very. I mean, you're you're you're, you're right, Claudia. Um, There's no really detailed study. Yeah. We need more. We need more. For the <laughs> we need another conference. Well, so well, we need a conference well. and not a symposium. Yeah, I saw the 1700s and six chair that you showed. Um, the one with the carvings in it, and I yeah. that reminds me of some of our um a lot of our dressers in the, the folklife collection. It often has the the date carved in a lot of and a lot yeah. of crafts people carved the date as well. But I liked the the fact that it could be four panels on your behind your back in the Scottish examples, or it could be two, or it could be one. It just seemed very much similar to the type of furniture as well and cupboards and presses whether the, how many panels you had but you know how the there was a connecting bar at the bottom is that for putting your feet on is that a foot rest on the scottish chairs and you'd see it, it's a turned you often saw it as a turned bar there you mean a stretcher on the yeah, lower yeah. part of the chair was that no well, a stretcher it, it's really a, a strengthening a piece of strength a strengthening uh component to make sure that the, that the legs um, are united and uh, so on but people do put their feet on them so you, you find that you find that lovely wear on on those um on yeah. that i don't think it was made as a footrest no it looked it looked comfortable though yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and just i think i have to find some more questions so if you bear with me they're all in coming in through a different channel on my email um mm. so um, Michael Farron has a question, and it seems like the Sligo chair mostly lives on in museums and in artistic reinterpretations. Um, I'm wondering if vernacular furniture can offer a solution to mass production in the modern world, and is there a pathway for it to re-enter the homes of ordinary people? Maybe via the, the big shop that you don't want to mention. <laughs> Have you? Does anyone want well, to take that? Um, well, I um, two things. I, I I wouldn't be so hard on 
IKEA because uh, they at least they do base some of their designs on regional uh, chairs. You know, in Sweden, that they have a, a as much of a diverse regional vernacular tradition as we do here in Scotland. Uh, but some of the chairs, the Dalana chair, for instance, uh, is based on a chair from Dalana. I know it's badly made, Laura, and uh, you know, made in China or something. But at least it's based on something which was designed in that country. We don't have any modern furniture makers in Scotland of in bulk in volume who 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 make any reference to. Um, design of the past here um, and secondly um, yes some of the vernacular types like the, the boarded stool that we have here in Scotland the creepy stool which mm. normally we call it's made of five boards one two three and two end boards for the seats um, that's a wonderfully um, wonderfully adaptable for, for modern um, cheap uh, construction you know, to do it well and do it cheaply, but it's just boards um, put together. The Sligo chair is not, not dissimilar, I think. No, thanks. Um, just a, another question coming in, I'll just read some here. Um, Mark Brady would like some advice from the woodworkers on the panel. I've made several Sligo chairs and inevitably back the back is less secure, it's more wobbly. Is this common with the design or do I need to look at how I'm making them? Um, well, I, I could answer that, I suppose. I think when you've got a Sligo chair with a very thick backboard, it's, it's likely to have a more secure join where the tusk turning comes through. You know, that thickness is absolutely crucial. So if, if his backboard isn't very thick, he's not going to be able to produce a joint which can withstand, you know, a big heavy man sitting down and moving around on it, which or leaning back on it, which there's a lot of strain on the back of every chair. <laughs> Um, so possibly that's why it's not working. I mean, I think he, uh, it's really lucky that the National Museum have got a couple of reproductions that you can sit on. Uh, last time I saw them there at Collins Barracks. But I would suggest that he can go and sit on that and, and, and handle it and pick it up and look at it um, and examine the dimension of that joint. And if he's having trouble with, with it becoming loose or insufficiently strong, you know, have a look and see how it's been reproduced. That's great. Yeah. And actually the one that you that with the sit down chair that we had, um, I started in the museum in 95, just and in 96, 95, 96, we acquired the chair from Tom Dowd because I was able to find that he was making them in still in tune. And that was the sit down chair. So for 20 years, people have been sitting in that chair and it looks it's mm -hmm. as strong and as sturdy and it looks as good on the day we got it 20 years ago. So the structure of the chair is absolutely incredible. It's just mm -hmm. so it's so strong. It's taking mm -hmm. it's Anna has been taking all those different um, different sizes and people and um over the years um emily cohen has the following message for laura abrading your hair with sandpaper i love that and we'll be stealing it thank you so much for going into such rich rich detail on your process laura you are a tremendous inspiration to young women in the craft um i'll just see if there's more questions as well um um jeremy right oh no i dealt with Jeremy, Jeremy's um, question on the agricultural material. Um, this D. Sinnott also mentioned again, she asked, given our old sea routes and connections with Spain, is there any connection with their furniture design and adaptation? Yes, in, in Scotland, certainly there is. And we, we have a certain, a certain a kind of settle called a Buchan settle or a Buck and Dees, which um, you find in the, the Basque country, which Claudia, you're, you, you've mentioned that, haven't you? The Zazuela, the Basque Zazuela. Uh, and, all, and similarly, in Portugal, you find uh, uh, what I was just talking about, the creepy stool, the, um, the boarded stool. You find that in Scotland, almost one of our, our iconic piece of furniture, really. Uh, you find that in fishing communities in coastal Portugal, certainly. And the link there is the fishing, the D. Yeah. Denoted, it's the, the yeah. fishing families who who migrate to other parts of Spain and things like that. They they they, they come back, and they they make similar kinds of furniture in both in both areas, and that happens both in in the European sea routes, but also within the sea routes in 
in the UK and the British Isles and Ireland as well. I so agree. Yeah. yeah, that's a brilliant example. Uh, I mean, I the, you mentioned botanists, David, earlier on. Um, but the thing I think you're talking about in Ireland is a, it's a big open frame settle with a little table on the back that hinges down or can be removed. And actually here where I'm sitting in West Cork in Southwest Ireland, I found it again and again. I didn't find it anywhere else in Ireland, but people were describing it to me. And it was such a complicated description. The, the, the four-legged saddle with a table on the back that took off and folded up or had one leg and folded up. <laughs> and I, I became a botanist and I called it the Carberry Settle. So I gave it this name. And then I, I did find it in Lisbon in the Folk Museum when I was when oh. I was in Lisbon, which I have been a couple of times. And uh, I found it again recently. Um, it's, uh, it's such a clever thing. So you can imagine, you know, pe people following the fishing fleets, which they did, of course, between... Um, particularly Northwest Ireland and East Scotland, the herring mm. fleet. There was yes, a lot of migration between Donegal and and your mm. east coast in Scotland. You know, they'd have they'd have discussed the furniture that people was using, Indeed. or they'd seen it in the houses when they were staying there, and they'd have come back and they said, "This is what we need." Yeah. Oh, there's certainly um, transmission of design through ideas, particularly between Scotland and yes. and parts uh, of Ireland. It's so strong there. I mean, you see it in the voice and the vocabulary, and I mean, my own family were Scottish planted from Scotland, Carlisle, into the west of Ireland. So I'm very aware of all that. Yes. Um, and I think, to see it, I mean, we've got in King Lucy, we've got that Grisettle actually in a painting that I've seen in my yes. in my studies of art history. Yes. So, yeah, there's a lot of design. Yes. Well, there are two morals from that, Claudia. First of all, never ask somebody to describe a piece of furniture to you because you can never understand what they're trying to say. They could say it's deep fried in, in chocolate, for, 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 as far as I'm concerned. But then uh, also, um, the, the fact this the preferences for furniture, it was mainly women, I think, who, um, who, who determined what furniture went in the households in the fishing communities, I think. So, you know, it was the women who decided that we should have a, um, a settle with a table falling down in the middle in, in a household, whether it was in Bucky or... Um, or, or, or Sintra, you know. Yeah. Um, there's just another question um, for Claudia. It's the tusk tenon and that dismantling of furniture. And I think um, there was a question, is it the earliest of flat pack? And I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, for sure, it's flat pack. I mean, furniture historians talk about um, medieval furniture, people moving, migrating maybe from their castle in the, in the summer to another place in the winter. So they'd pack up, you know, they'd have chests, they'd have tables where the tops would be taken off the bases and the bases would dismantle. And the toss tenon very often held the base together and it could be removed. I saw one in Maynooth University, actually, when I was there not long ago. Um, I couldn't find the photograph of it, actually. But the toss tenon is great. You just knock it out, take it apart. It's just the original flat pack. And for yeah. sure, people wanted to carry furniture around on the back of their horses or on their, their wagons. And, you know, they had to reduce it in size. So... Yes, the toss tenon and the three wedge tenon, all, all those glueless joints which we saw, that, that they're all they're all of ancient lineage. But also in Ireland, people went on doing stuff for a very long time. They they seem to be reluctant to change. We didn't have an industrial revolution that changed things here. Um, you know, you find very archaic features going on right up to very recently. I mean, the pit saw is still being used in the 1930s um, in County Wicklow. You know, you don't get that in England very much. It's so th those medieval bits of construction don't mean that it's medieval. It means they're just doing things in a very, very traditional way, and they haven't changed necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then they copy each other, and they love to copy things slavishly. I mean, I studied something called the noggin, which is this little drinking vessel that, that's made completely of wood with no screws, no nails, no glue. And when I discovered about the noggin weavers who made them. Um, the early text said that they, they passed it from father to son and he, he made it exactly as his father had done it. There was absolutely no change. It was identical. So there's this feeling of, um, you know, there's no evolution. There's just sort of, let's do it like this because you've got my tools and now you're doing it and, you know, the tools allow him to make it, but he's not going to change the design because it works. And I think that's probably what happened with the Sligo chair. That's that's amazing. That's great. Yeah. And I just saw that there's um, questions about all of your books and papers. So um, so maybe you the book with um, 
Laura, your book is coming out. Could you give the name of that again? The one that you did um, um, together um, or that you were co-authoring originally before COVID? Um, that again. Mr. Uh, Joyce, gender, uh, jo joinery, Joyce and gender, um, a history of woodworking for the 21st century. Great. It'll be coming out in mid-March. Brilliant. And um, in terms of Stephen and David, Stephen, uh, have you a paper coming out soon? Is that what was, there was um, a question on that? Well, well, I think I was directed at David. Okay, and was that David Grant? I believe, okay. yes. Yeah. So David is in... Well, uh, he's yeah. on, I'm publishing it, an expanded version of that in 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 the the journal Regional Furniture next year, okay. this this coming year. Uh, yeah, that's right, 2022, with some some more uh, contemporary designers, I hopefully. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you get lower. <laughs> um, yes, Laura. Yes. Yeah. I was interested, Laura. I, I I mean, I don't know whether you have looked at Orkney chairs, but I was certainly very interested in the comparison between your porter's chairs and uh, the boarded Orkney chairs, not the not the oat straw ones. Have you mm -hmm. seen those? I have, yeah, I have. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And also the, uh, the straw, oat straw ones are really cool too. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, there's a British designer, um, Gareth Neal, who is doing an uh -huh. interpretation of them. Um, yes, yeah. Version. Yeah. There's several, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we'll wrap it up now soon and I really want to thank you it's it's coming on to five o'clock now or it is five but it's probably is it eight o'clock over there Laura or is it oh, nine o'clock nine o'clock <laughs> right yeah. we've had two hours wow um well listen thank you so much we're um it was really wonderful and it was just so interesting to hear you all discussing um the especially the the provenance and where and the origins you know it's i think there's another day in this um but um or another or a few more papers anyway um but thanks so much barbara thank you to laura thanks to everybody and i'd encourage you to go onto our social media sites in the national museum on facebook and twitter and you could there's there's discussion um, continuing there and please do visit us in the National Museum of Ireland Country Life um, we're here in Thurla in, uh, just outside of Castlebar in County Mayo and um, we're looking forward to a lot of visitors this summer and thank you Gurmila Maig of Ligalair your time and your attention and that's what made this so thank you very much <laughs>